Welcome everyone to Comics from the Multiverse. This is episode 250. I am Pierre and joining me as always is Matt. 249 too many. <laughs> That's the mid to start on today, isn't it? Uh, I, I expect you to be more positive of the two of you. But... Uh, there, there, there's a whole lot going on. My computer's giving me a whole load of crap right now, so that's Well, that's great. because you're using a computer that is ancient. Yes, I know. But it still works, which is the important part. I mean, not works, but theoretically it works. No, it's not the important part. If I get annoyed at a piece of tech, I need to replace it, right? That's just... That's... Yeah, it must be nice. You're also not in the process of refinancing a house. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, well. Here's, here's Carter's here, too. Yeah, I'm in a good mood. My my team survived relegation in, in the football today. We we lost, but it doesn't matter because the other results that happened meant that we're, we're safe for next season. So oh, yeah. things are good. F failing up Addition words, by yes. subtraction. Yes. We had a really good week last week. Like We won like three games in a row, which we haven't done all season. We haven't even won two games in a row all season. So that, that basically secured it. We were just waiting for the mathematic certainty today, mm -hmm. which thanks to Derby being shit and losing, uh, it, it did. What, what level are you guys at? Championship, so we're the one below the top. Gotcha. Yes. Uh, I, I I even have a joke to make about this. It's, it's that uninteresting to me. So, this is a DC Comics podcast. Uh, we will talk about our DC Comics that we read every week. Uh, coming up on this week's show, we have Justice League issue 60, The Flash 769, Nightwing 79, Catwoman 30, as the new books we're talking about, plus there's a couple of Patreon books as well. But of course, it is Solicit's week too. Uh, although I almost thought it wasn't going to be, because instead of coming out at the normal time on a Friday like they normally do, not only are they a week late than they used to be these past couple months, uh, this batch also just happened to drop at like a weird time in the middle of the night. Even in Pacific time, it was like after midnight. So, very, very odd. Uh, apparently, because the person at DC who used to do all the solicits left the job a couple months ago, and I don't know if they've just got some intern who comes in and goes, oh shit, I better uh, throw some solicits together. Uh, this one's a bit weird where we spoke last week how there was a planned Tom Taylor reveal for last Friday, the day before we recorded, yes. and it got pushed to Wednesday, which did happen, well, I'll just talk about that in a minute, but I wonder if like maybe they were still finalizing a couple of things. That's why this one maybe. was so late. Because uh, it was still technically on the Friday, or at least, well, I mean, technically not, because it was like maybe post-midnight in most time zones. But that said, though, they're on the West Coast now, so I think they might have just snuck in at like midnight. They might have just Probably had it in before midnight. when they sent out the press release, it was just, we had to wait for the websites to regurgitate it for us. Yeah, because I, I think UK time, it was like 7 a.m. The solicits went out, 8 a.m., something like that. It was some sort of weird time. So mm. I was surprised because I got up today and went, oh, there is solicits, because I checked yesterday, you know, after they normally come out and go, why is there no solicits? This is weird. What's going on? So we do have solicits. We have July solicits to look at. There's a lot of interesting things that are mixed in there. Uh, so we'll go through that in a minute. But it is episode 250. So I'll remind everyone that before the next episode, you're getting a special. You're getting the results of the top 50 DC Comics characters countdown. Uh, I'll be revealing the results to uh, these two lugheads. Um, we're recording that tomorrow. So it'll be the next couple of days. It'll premiere on YouTube. It'll obviously go up in the audio feed as well. Uh, so look forward to that. But just, you know, thank you to everyone who's been here for 250 episodes, wherever you joined up along the way, and kept this this uh, little train going on the on the DC tracks. It's like, it's like the movie Unstoppable with Chris Pine and Denzel Washington. I, I agree. Nothing stops this train. Yes. <laughs> Not even Scott Lobdell. <laughs> he tried. He tried for many years. <laughs> he did try. <laughs> One might argue Dan did you also. He, John Romita Jr. tried. I feel like there's a lot of things that we have we have succeeded in spite of at DC. We have endured. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> what? I'm trying to paraphrase that One Division line. What? What? What is? Uh... What is hope? But not or what is grief if not love persevering? Yeah, I'm trying to like spin that into. Yeah. Uh... What is uh, JRJR, fandom? if not fandom persevering? <laughs> uh, no, what is, what is, is Lobdell? What is spite, if not fandom persevering? No, what, what is Lobdell, if not Superman persevering? <laughs> that, that's just mean. <laughs> the, um, 
the official DC Twitter account, you know, it'll sometimes post snippets of reviews. You know, like the, the usual thing, like here's a little quote to, uh, to promote the new books. And they were, they did one to promote Nightwing this week. And mm-hmm. I don't have the exact thing in front of me, but it was like completely indirectly just throwing a lot of shade on Nightwing over the last few years. It was like Nightwing's back. And it's so weird to see the official account kind of acknowledge essentially what had happened over the last few years. Uh, all that was missing was now 100% DDO free. I don't know if that's all it was, but there was enough a change of the guard amongst all the editors and amongst yeah. a lot of the positions that clearly they're not against throwing a little shade uh, yeah. over the last few years. Of, you know, not everything, obviously, there was a lot of good stuff in the last few years, but uh, clearly that was one area where everyone pretty much universally agreed this is shite and uh, there's no redeeming qualities. So I, I don't um, think we've had a Ben Percy on a, on a DC book since, have we? Mm-mm. Ben Percy? Yeah. Yeah, from, from you know, Green Arrow? Yes, yeah, so no, I know and, he's from Green Arrow. And was he, uh, I, I'll be honest, I kind of forgot he did a Nightwing. He, uh, he was doing it until the issue before <laughs> it happened, and then yeah. I his don't, run very abruptly ended. I don't blame him, um, and it sounds familiar now you're saying it, but if you'd asked me who was writing Nightwing that you were upset their run ended on so abruptly when they did the Rick Grace stuff, I couldn't have told you in a million years it was Ben Percy. <laughs> Clearly, I'm still upset because I like Ben Percy. I like and it Ben feels Percy. Like that editorial spat kind of led to him not doing any more DC books. Look, after 250 episodes of this dab show, we've went through so many writers and artists on so many different books. I can't remember them all. Okay, some of them slipped through the cracks, and I have I'll to. Accept. And I have to remember that Cold Snap exists. So, unfortunately, a few sacrifices must be made here or there to retain my knowledge of Cold Snap. Well, I mean, you should remember the Nightwing stuff because Silencer showed up, and that's really... Oh, that was good, yeah, I remember that. She, she showed up there, and then in, in the we Bendis the Lion and not stuff. Wacky Races. It was, it was literally yeah. the last two issues, they had that Wacky Races thing in Ireland yeah. with Silencer and other various, like, you know, B-list and C-list villains mm-hmm. around, but it was fun. Um, <laughs> but hey, new new era, new dawn, all, all that shenanigans. So yes, thank you to everyone for helping us get to episode 250, uh, uh, so we'll have that special celebrating the occasion. Uh, because these episodes are long enough to do it on the actual episode, but uh, I will just put in a thank you here, and uh, you know, here's to many more. So, uh, but of course, we will kick off with everyone's favorite new segment, the Comicsology Top Ten. <laughs> this is quick and painless. Matt likes have, to make a face. Have you ever received a, a, a positive comment yet about these? Uh, yes, I have. In fact, not from yourself. <laughs> Not from like, I like doing them. <laughs> I never said such a thing. Look, people, ah, like, since it's being challenged here, if people would like to respond to the Twitter at DC Comics Podcast or wherever and let us know you enjoy the Comicsology Top 10, just to check in, see how things are doing on a weekly basis, then by all means, please, please do. Uh, just to, to shut these two up, at least a little Tip bit. <laughs> They're probably scrubbed from the existence now, but when you used to do the the original Mild Fuzz 1.21, uh, I would get like this going over the, the box office too. But he didn't make me play the guessing game, but it's just numbers. I don't just like... Oh, I don't know why. Numbers. Box office is great. Box office is a great thing to talk about. Uh, I don't like it. Matt's going to be guesting on a new show called Box Office Weekly uh, once the movie theaters uh, are all back up I and running. I will not. <laughs> <laughs> Just going to be a box office show and nothing but that. Uh, so yeah, looking at Kamisology's top 10, uh, so I always just open it at the start of the show every week uh, and see what was happening. Uh, there's three DC books on the top 10. Uh, given that we covered four new releases this week, that's pretty good going, I guess, in terms of how much they put out this week that was big enough. Uh, and I'm happy to say that number one is a DC book. Nightwing. Nightwing 79 is number one, yeah. baby. You, Where it you should be. I know? How do you know? I almost didn't get my physical copy <laughs> uh, because the guy that worked for the shop forgot to add it last month when I asked him to add it to my pull list. Uh, and I went to go get it and he goes, oh yeah, people came in and bought it up. Luckily they had some put aside, so I got it. But um, yeah, that thing for whatever reason was going for $20 in the aftermarket sale, which I don't understand. Um, I, mean, I, know it's, I know it's completely sold out at the distributor level and it's going for a second printing yeah. and the second printing cover is absolutely phenomenal i don't know if you've yeah. seen it mm-hmm. 
it's um it's kind of like you know the old uh, from like the the Batman sixties with the, you know walking up the wall. It's that, but uh, it's just Robin going through like different costumes. So you know, start his mm-hmm. Robin costume, then you know original Nightwing, uh, and so on, so on. Yeah, and Batgirl's at the top, kind of waiting on him. Uh, there's actually yeah. a, there's a page in the issue that's kind of a similar idea with him, like the various costumes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it is kind of inspired by something in the book, which is nice. Sometimes these variants are just so random. It's like, oh, I got yeah. a wacky idea for a cover. So we'll just. But it's almost as if someone drew it up for fun. Is it, is it a Redondo? Uh, I think it is. Yeah. It's I know like he, he was, he he was saying that he was just fun. glad that it, he got a chance to yeah. use it. So I think he maybe right. did tour it for fun and was like, hey, guys, do, do you want this as a cover at some point? Yeah. And they're like, well, if we need it. Um, and and there's a long time Nightwing fan. I'm, I'm happy that it's in the number one spot. Right. Yeah. Like, um, I mean, I guess, I guess there's like a new villain introduced in the this year. That we'll obviously not talk about it yet, but I mean, I guess maybe that's yeah. the reason. Is that why? But it's still, going for, for, for it to go up that much, like I don't, I don't get it. I, I want to know who's inside that's trying to leak stuff to speculators. It, going like, I I don't think there's anything to do with speculators on this one. I think it's simply the fact that it, issue one or you know whatever the seventy eight mm-hmm. uh, you know sold so much better than expected, even right. with it being the you know fairly higher profile uh right. i think it caught people off and because of the way retailers have to order so far in advance they just didn't have enough copies of this so what, one you're, what you're saying is is that people did not foolishly did not believe in tom taylor and it's bet them mm-hmm. that's what you're saying yeah the fools Pretty much. absolute fools uh so that's something that should hopefully smooth out then as the run goes on, mm-hmm. just because, you know, the older more Well, I, I and... definitely made sure he got out my pull list and, and put it down in front of me <laughs> to make sure this does not happen again. Um, so, yeah. yeah. That was almost a disaster. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, number two here is X-Force 19, so I guess that's going. Uh, number three is Way of X, issue one. Didn't uh, they just announce, like, a whole bunch, like, a new X-Men reboot that's coming yeah, in a few with, months? Yeah, with, with Dugan uh, doing it, but X Force has that been Percy, former Nightwing writer? What? Oh, I don't know, actually. Maybe he's definitely doing a couple of X books. Yeah, he? I think he's doing Wolverine. I don't know if he's doing X Force. Yes. I know he started X Force because I almost picked it up back it, and then I just couldn't keep up with all the X Men stuff. Yeah. Uh, oh, all the Hickman stuff just kind of took me off yeah. for a while. Uh, maybe I'll check it out when they launch all this new stuff. But I want. I like. That's why I loved Astonishing X Men so much because it was self-contained enough. You know. <laughs> Like, Mass casually bringing that up as if it wasn't like 14 years old at this point. No, yeah, yeah, but I'm just saying, like, at that time, X Men was super, I don't want to say convoluted, but there's a lot going on. And then Whedon oh. comes in and just does the self contained. I, I would say, like, story. 90% of its history at this point, X Men has been super convoluted. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and I kind of want to get back to a point where we can have, like, I, I, I guess nice I'm just. Self contained X Book. There's like staples though in the timeline where I feel like Matt's just sort of like planted his feet and said that's the part of the timeline we were in, and has refused to accept that it's been so long now that the reference is a little, uh, just less than contemporary, shall I, shall I say? Yeah, and that's fine. <laughs> I'm an old man. What do you want? <laughs> you keep yelling at the kids on your lawn and be uh, happy about it. I had to yell at a kid on my lawn last night. Funnily enough. Not they're gonna ring my doorbell. Okay, right. Connor is sitting drinking the most stupid looking drink. What is what's going on right now? <laughs> this is a bourbon uh, renewal. Yeah. I don't care what. It, 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 wow, it. Pete. Hey, you know, Connor, I appreciate the metal straw. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate uh, uh, the metal straw. Environmentally conscious. Yes, very much so. Anyways, yeah. this is a modern classic. Was it before? I'm just, I just think it's funny. We're sitting, we're on a podcast, and I just see this, what looks like a cocktail, like come up cocktail. out of frame and the straw coming in. <laughs> Why would I know that, Matt? Why would I know what a cocktail is and isn't? Because Connor has a drinking problem. What else would it be? It could be just whiskey. I mean, I know it's not because it's like pink, right? Oh, jeez. But it could be anything. Oh, man. It could but just a be glass a glass of this shape and size and this color. What else would it possibly be? I don't Juice. know. Pink, pink flavored. You, you get different like sort of booze that's with a variety of colors. Yeah. All right. What's number four? Yeah. What do you want from me? Look, I'm just saying. He sat over there with his stupid cocktail, and it caught me off guard. It's okay. Very nice cocktail. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm sure it's delightful. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure you're having a happy time. I, I hope you've got. Uh, should, Joey should get what, what, what do you call him? Ah, forgotten. 
I want to crack a joke and I've forgotten the name of the bloody things. <laughs> Matt, when you go to Hawaii, you put them around your neck. Wait, wait, wait. Lua. LA. Thank you. Yes. You should get yeah. some of those. Maybe, uh... Don't, don't tempt him. He will. No. He's been drinking enough rum lately. No, Joe, you should do it. You should get, like, a little cheap blow-up, like, paddling pool and sit in that when he's doing the podcast. Uh, just sit and float in the pool. That just seems like a fun idea. A that sounds amazing. <laughs> a, a little, you know what, like, what, one meter, like, circumference <laughs> pool. Just sit in that. If that was realistically possible, I would definitely do that. I would be chill, I'd have a drink, I'd just talk shit yes. for three hours, it'd be great. <laughs> okay, I know what I'm doing for episode 500, I'm getting a little paddling pill and I'm going to do the entire podcast sitting, floating on an inflatable <laughs> chair. Uh... Why not just make that the new thing going forward with 251? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and build up to it. Come on, you got to build a bit of suspense for the for the paddling pool. All right, uh, number four is Sword issue five. Uh, number five, we're back to DC book. Uh, we have Justice League issue sixty uh, at number five. And uh, stuff number six is the main Spider Man sixty four. Seven's Eternals number four. Number eight is Alien issue two, which is neat because I like Alien, but uh, I didn't really like the look of the art in the book. So okay, uh, number- uh, the cover had Hicks on the front though. Mm. You see that? Yeah, but it's La Rocca still. Yeah. I know, but I'm just saying, like, you know. Look, I'm at the point of my life where I less and less things will nostalgia trap me, and that's not enough. <laughs> I'm sorry, didn't you just start watching the Mighty Ducks TV show? Yeah. Well, yeah, and but... Talk about how great it is? It was great. It is actually surprisingly very good. the Mighty Ducks film? I did watch the Mighty Ducks film. Look, just because you're stalking my letterbox like some sort of little weirdo, some sort of little deranged gender weirdo, he's got, he's got his like binoculars out watching, what, what's Peter watching on, yeah, on actually, the TV? I pressed, I pressed refresh on my front page and it told me that was what you did. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not on letterbox. You have to go to my Twitter to know what I'm watching. <laughs> Look, is it really that shocking that I was in the mood to watch the Mighty Ducks movie after saying, watching some of the show? I claim that things don't nostalgia trap you anymore. Um, how many episodes is the show, Pete? Do you know? I actually don't know. Uh, oh, about right. episode five just came out. Um, no, yeah. there's a difference. I checked that out, and then once I realized I liked it, it put me in the mood for Maya Ducks things. I, I am not being nostalgia trap because it's... someone's parading a character that I you know should get excited for in front of me. There's a difference. I'm just saying, it's all Hicks on the cover, and I thought of you because I know how much you love Corporal Hicks. I appreciate, I appreciate the thought, Matt. I do. I, I do. Uh, somehow Matt started that, but Connor's the one that I got annoyed at throughout the course of the conversation. That's, I just, that's how it goes. I, I was talking about the sound <laughs> trap. I, I still have 20 minutes of Mortal Kombat to finish when, when I get a chance tonight. So, you know. Uh, definitely, hit, definitely hitting those nostalgia buttons. It, it, shocker. It's not that good, but it's very watchable. So, <laughs> so uh, I'll watch after a few drinks. There's definitely yeah. some moments of stupidity. Uh, oh, 100% stupidity. Like, but, I, I don't know if you got there yet. I would say what they are, but yeah. there's a thing where like they all have powers to unlock, and when <laughs> one person's power unlocks, I started laughing because it was such a conveniently stupid thing for that person to get. Uh-huh. Like, I, for I, that I, character? Yes. You're like, oh, let's tell her tie that in. Uh, very convenient. Yeah. <laughs> I think I might watch it one night in the week instead of a, instead of an episode of Riverdale. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're very. Right. It'll, it'll it take the same very... slot as I'll have a couple yeah. of minutes. I'll watch no, it. you should watch it tomorrow. So instead of the Oscars, watch Mortal Kombat and get like yeah. a, a true Oscar yeah. potential. I, I might, I might do that anyways because so. I'm yeah, I'm so out on the Oscars this year just because I didn't really watch anything. Um, uh, so. I watched all the best picture films yes. this past week, with yep, the exception yep. of maybe one that I saw. Yeah, I saw Trial of Chicago Seven a while back. Yeah. All right, real quick though, which was the best one you saw? It's down to, I can narrow it down to three. Uh, Trash Cargo 7. Yeah. Uh, Hubie Hall. Halloween, right? It must be Hubie Halloween. The Father, although I will admit that one's more just on a, I mean, I think it's very, or very good. Uh, yeah. but I think it hit me a bit harder than, than maybe some other people. Sorry, the Hedgehog. That's his real answer. Let's not go. I, I got attacked this week. <laughs> because I, did you jump I, into I, old thread? I, I did. And not not realizing. Have you not learned. All right, get get context. Give context for the, the, so, the so tangent. Good friend Alden was uh, talking about how studios shouldn't always cave to fan demands because you know sometimes stupid things happen, like bring Tony Stark back to life. Oh, the stupid uh, billboard. That's, that's, that's yeah, I think, I think it's bring back Tony Stark to life. It's really life, awkwardly yeah. worded. 
I can't even put the grammar that bad in my I, head. I, right? Just on that. Yeah. A character has a long run, has a fitting send off. Mm-hmm. That is all you should want as a fan. 20, Shut up. 20, right? <laughs> a 22 film journey that begins and ends with this character. And yet you just, you want him back to well, life. Well, they, they, they were jealous. Uh, they, they saw Restore the Snyderverse. And they were like, right. we want to have fun too. Yeah. And and so he brought up Sonic, which maybe wasn't the best uh, example. Um, however, I didn't see Sonic. I don't plan on seeing Sonic. But I doubt the character design would have made someone like me, who doesn't care about Sonic, uh, more wanting to see that movie. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I get where it's coming from. That it inspired the, the the modern trend of right. caving to demands. Even though, yes, it looks objectively better now. It does. It is definitely better than it was but, before. But right. should they have caved? Should they kept with their original intention? Especially the fact that you know, lots of people had to crunch in the, the think, VFX department to redo right. pretty much the entire film. I think the weird thing about that example, though, is that clearly people behind the scenes agreed. I, I get the feeling the director didn't mm-hmm. like it as it was either. And this was like, right, like exactly. oh, we have an but excuse now. We, oh, look, see, people are making fun right. of it. All, all people saw Alden talking about was that they should have just let Ugly Sonic live and maybe not, you know, cave to, to fandom ends. Which, again, probably a bad example because it seemed like behind the scenes they were looking for an excuse to change it, right? Like, yeah. However, this brought out a section of the internet that I try to stay away from. And yeah, it was people with anime avatars just, <laughs> just swarming. It is mostly them, yeah. It, it is. And I woke up to a, a thing of, of 40 people liking a comment responding to me and 38 out of the 40 had anime avatars. And I'm pretty sure it was really only five people. Um, but... Yeah, it was a whole thing, and I'm just like, I I don't know how he has the energy for that. I'm sure the block and mute buttons work very he, good He does it, him. like, every goddamn week, that moron. Yeah, and I just, I I can't. But I appreciate his sentiment, and I do agree. I Because, again, not to sound like an old man, I remember when something would come out, and you just had to deal with it, and it, hopefully the next person that gets it is, you know, what yeah, you want to see. I, I was saying, so. for me, the trend started... Not in movies, but in in games. Uh, the mm-hmm. ending of Mass Effect Three, when that came out, was a whole thing. And then you had like uh, over the next couple of months, them like patch in a new ending, essentially yeah. to like expand upon it and make it better. And again, the updated version is better, but yeah. it's more just. It's it's the thing. If you want it, my here's my my end all take is if you really care as much about that stuff, then go. Be a creative. Get yourself in that position, right? Like, as much as we can sit here and review comics and stuff, if we really want to make a, a change, then we, we should, you know, try in, to in work day, forward. In days today. gone by, this is what fan fiction yeah. was for. Exactly. Go go write it. You know, like, I I, vas- I really want a new Friday the 13th movie, right? But I feel like the only way I'm going to be able to, to get that right now is if I sit and write my own, and then it lives in my head. Like Connor just said, fan fiction. I'm not going to publish it, right? I might send it to some friends so they can see. Oh, but, please do. Yeah. Oh, I oh I will, Pete. It's, uh, <laughs> I'm sure. Very I, I would very need. Brave. I I would need I would need Pete and Tim's input for for some oh, stuff. I'll right? just say that there'll there'll be a yeah. special uh, one off thing happening on YouTube where we do a a, a, a script read performance a rehearsal of Master sure. the Thirteenth script. Well, I'll just say that Jason <laughs> might might end up being more of a hero than a villain. Let's just let's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where he became. Anyway, long story short, I just the, the fan stuff like this. I'm just I'm so tired of it. I'm tired of them thinking they can just bitch and whine and complain, and that's it. Like there's no goodwill. It's this is what I want, um, and I don't know. There's there's other ways to engage in the creative there's, process. There's an entitlement know? issue at times, and yeah. I, it you know is what it is. I yes. Anyway, number nine uh, on this top ten. <laughs> The Flash, 769. So that's your third DC book. Wow. Um, no, no Catwoman. Did I miss Catwoman? No, nah, no Catwoman. Um, I'll tell you what hey, it is in a minute. people, get uh, on it. Number 10 is Avengers 45. Uh, so if I just expand here to see where uh, Catwoman landed. Yeah. And also, can you check if it is there, uh, the Infinite Frontier Secret Files, the first issue of that, which yeah. is the, the digital first that they are collecting later. Yeah. 
I'm intrigued uh, by that one. And for the Frontier Secret Files is... 14. Uh, okay. That's not too bad list. for a digital first. I'm assuming they're a dollar. Uh, oh, no, so they're two dollars. Oh, okay. I don't know how long they are, admittedly. They could be longer than, than usual. I, no, I think they're doing, like, the next Batman, where it's the uh, three issues equal one issue. Um... I think. No, the Infinite Frontier, they're doing it as the one big 80 page one yeah. shot. With the oh, so maybe they are. Yeah. Maybe it was longer then. Yeah. Well, I'm waiting for that 80 pager. So, you know. Dang. I'm surprised Catwoman's not there. People should be reading Catwoman. People should Save be reading Someone that just caught up on Catwoman. <laughs> yeah, and that's finally on board with the rest of us. Yeah. Yeah, I'm actually just. Uh... Try to find it. Am I missing something here? Where's Catwoman? I, I had a new uh, Ram B book arrive today. One what of his is? older works. I remember. Um, that, that's kind of hard to find, and I, I was yeah. very glad to find it. An did, absolute steal. So, did you pick up the mini Desa Layla Star? Yes. I'm ready yet. Okay. But of course I did. Yeah. I, I picked it up just because it's Ram B, and you, you got to support the creator and stuff too, right? Like, yeah, oh, yeah. for sure. Uh, so, yeah, Catwoman is actually number 21 currently. Okay. That's not too far off. It's a little bit further than everything else, though. I mean, the fact that the digital mm -hmm. first book's uh, above it is a bit notable. It's, that's an issue one, and it's cheaper, so that is maybe mm -hmm. why. And uh, uh, to be fair, Catwoman has not traditionally been a great seller. Right. So this might be kind of normal placement for it. I mean, I suppose I mean, that's fair. But, I mean, there I are... Know if... I, mean, I, I mean, I mean, they're on sale, I think, but there are trades that are beaten and stuff, so it's a little yeah. distressing. I just... How long was Brubaker's run on Catwoman? Because I feel like it wasn't that long... And even he, you know, wasn't uh, making it sell back in the day. Yeah, it's only a few years, right? Yeah. There's at least there's a couple of thick trades, I think, of it. Two or three yeah. of those. So it was lengthy enough, but not... Yeah, but that's what I mean. Like, so it must have, you know, it was just one of those titles that I don't think moves as much as we think it does. Enough but that it, should it be right pretty now. much always has a title going. Yeah. But not enough that it's ever in the bestsellers list. Right. Yeah, that's fair. So there you go, that's your comicsology. Uh, top 10. If nothing else, it's a vehicle for lots of tangent, apparently, uh, as I'm coming mm -hmm. to learn as these weeks go on. Uh, <laughs> so there you go. So, solicits. We have solicits for July, and we have some juicy tidbits within these solicits, so we're going to work through as we do. We'll tackle things as we get to them. Uh, and the first thing on these solicits is Superman, Son of Kal-El, issue 1, which mm -hmm. is noble because not only is this a new book, this is actually the Superman book now. Superman as a book is is not here. It's gone, and right. it's replaced with Superman, Son of Kal-El, which is obviously Jonathan. More notably, though, this is not Philip Keddie Johnson. He's still doing action. That's still going. Yep. His run's still continuing with that. It turns out his few issues of Superman were just the lead-in to set up the, the very separate book, which is Tom Taylor doing Superman, Son of Kal-El, and this is launching in July. $4 book, no backup. No, there's there, a backup. There is a backup. Is there? Yes, it's, it, it's, it's continuing the tales of Metropolis. Well, it says four dollars, but it's only yeah. thirty-two pages, so that means the main story must be short. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Cause, maybe cause, there's a typo somewhere. Yeah, because it says three ninety-nine and then four ninety-nine for the cardstock, which is which is normal. But there's a Jen Bartel cardstock variant, which is gorgeous. Know, might be worth the extra dollar for sure. Uh, maybe. Well, it's a one to twenty-five though, so it's yeah, a good score. Sells it at cover price. Yes. Yeah, I, I'm exp See, I feel like because it says three ninety-nine and thirty-two pages, that that's more likely to be right. But then again, if it's copy and pasted from the one section, maybe they're just both wrong. Uh, but then again, all of the other prices all match up with that three ninety-nine. Yeah. So I, I was gonna say, if if there is a backup, I think it's interesting to me, and it tells me that. This was never meant to be originally. They didn't plan for this to be its own book. Like, I think it was would have just carried on in Superman, and they would have just carried on from whatever number it would have been, mm -hmm. uh, because the backup is just uh, uh, apparently uh, just continuing the Jimmy Olsen backup that we've got going right mm -hmm. now. Yeah, so that actually has to finish, or, or or maybe that finishes in the, the issue before us, and this is and the typo here, the, or the mistake is just that they've copy and pasted in this. That could backup, be because it says. But... Tells of Metropolis continue. Jimmy Olsen gathers his misfit heroes, including Ambush Bug and Gangbuster. So we've we've already had the Bibbo story. We've had the Ambush Bug. Now we'll be getting Gangbuster. I'm, so, I want to go back and check. Uh, mm -hmm. Check Jin's Superman source and see what it says. Yeah, that's what I'm up. doing. Just see if it's the same one. Because um, that could be possible. the explanation for this. 
Uh, but yeah, so uh, yeah, so Superman it, has said too many times to just search. <laughs> I'll just put Superman in the hashtag for the issue number. I've control F many solicitors, so yeah. I've learned the tricks. Yeah. <laughs> but it yeah. doesn't look like action has a backup, and that's just a full forty um, pages. Superman last issue just says elsewhere back home on Earth, Jimmy Olsen leads his misfit team on the hunt for sinister projectress. Mm. So that's different text. That's it's not text. a copy and paste job. Yeah. Curious, curious to see what happens there. Um, I'm gonna put, then it says if you read the in action. Yeah, someone, I feel like the, these going up late has really messed things up. Yeah, there's, um, a, there's mistakes somewhere here. Either there's no backups and they're $4 books, or they're $5 books and they have backups. But, <laughs> so yeah. we'll, see, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, the fact that this is continuing the backup story would lead me to think that, okay, maybe it is got a backup because it is continuing one that's already started. But, mm-hmm. uh, we'll see, we'll see. But anyway... Tom Taylor is now the Superman writer, but it's not Clark Kent. It is, it is John Kent. Uh, that is surely... And given that we have had a, t- a good significant taste, I would say, of what Taylor would do with John mm-hmm. Kent Superman through Deceased, I think there's yep. a lot of reasons to be excited by this. I, I really think it's something that he has managed to write the son of Batman, but, you know, Dick Grayson, and now the actual the son of, you know, Superman. In, in both ongoing books right now. Mm-hmm. That's a feat. So That is pretty yeah. cool, actually. Um, it's almost like, and I'm not saying that he wouldn't have got this anyway, but it's almost like mm-hmm. what he did in Deceased might have even like mm-hmm. convinced a lot of people, you know, in positions of power to make these calls to go, hey, <laughs> he could easily yep. handle these books. We, could, we can give him these big characters and he's clearly going to knock it out of the park. So mm-hmm. why don't we? Yeah, and it definitely feels like Future State was tipping the hand at that, right? Like, even mm-hmm. more than we were it, aware it, of. It does seem like it's a... In, in terms of possible futures and as far as those go, mm-hmm. it's a lot more of a mission statement as to the direction that they wanted to head in rather yeah. than just, oh, here's a you know fantasal, fantasal idea. Yeah. And while I was obviously mixed on those Superman stories with john and future state it wasn't tom taylor writing those stories and i think that's the right. key difference mm-hmm. that was someone that's else big difference and we have john Timms on the art here for this issue as well so um the fact that we're going to have two ongoing tom taylor books plus the, the many still going come july and, makes and me happy. Been teasing there's more announcements to come over the rest of the year well i just th- tom i can only i can only be so happy okay i, I like don't don't make me too happy <laughs> Equilibrium must be maintained. <laughs> uh, but what a special treat of announcement for uh, episode mm-hmm. 250. I am pleased with that. Um, but there was actually another new Superman book, which this one came out of nowhere yeah. for me. I didn't see this coming out. I just looked at the solicitors and went, wait, what's this? So We've known this was actually coming for a little while because it leaked in the on, on Amazon as the collection. Like a oh, really? Back. I, mean, yeah. I, I believed I had maybe just forgotten about it, but it's not been heavily... Like reported on, but, but but was it leaked with this creative team or just the title? No, the crea- the full creative team. So, huh. um, well, look at me, I'm Connor. I remember every little thing that leaks. <laughs> I remember interesting things that leak. Yeah. So this is a Superman and the uh, the Superman and the Authority issue one. Uh, Grant Morrison writing with Mikkel Yannin on the art. This is a yeah. four issue mini, five dollars forty pages four issues. I mean. As much as I am hit and miss quite a bit on Grant Morrison, I cannot say that I am not super interested in trying this. Mm-hmm. It's weird because I, I care very little about the authority as a rule, because mm-hmm. I care very little about everything Wildstorm as a rule. Yeah, as you do. Um, yeah. But it's got Manchester Black on the team, uh, potentially mm-hmm. even leading the team, which is interesting. Obviously, Morrison, uh, big fan. Yanin, fantastic. And then the fact that, because when, when we heard this and we saw the design for Superman on the front, it looked like, because he's got the belt, but he hasn't got the, he hasn't got the, uh, the, the red undies. So we thought, is this like a, a weird out of continuity sequel to his new 52 mm-hmm. stuff? Um, but everything about it sounds like it's completely in continuity with, especially what's going on in action comics and you know, the, the yeah. war world stuff. Yeah, I'm intrigued. I mean, I, I, mean, I agree. I'm not really big on 
uh, the authority or any of that stuff. I I don't really care. But I like what Ganon's was Manchester art. Black's team name? Uh, the Elite? Um, yeah. The Elite, there we go. So, this is definitely a divergence <laughs> Just, from that. I've not talked about that in such a long time that as soon as I said that, all I could think about was, like, Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks. <laughs> and, the, and the Bucks, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's Can't what we need. Their sneakers, Pete. We we need the uh, the uh, Manchester Black is all elite tweet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to, to come For up. Sure. <laughs> um, but no, but just looking at at this team on the cover, right? You got Apollo and Midnighter. You got a new Light Ray. It looks like Enchantress. What well, looks like a new Omac. Um, and then Natasha Irons. So yeah. it's quite an array of characters. So, um, yeah, and they all kind of also fit that authority, you know, from from what I remember seeing the ads way, way back. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll give it a fair shot. I'll give it a it, fair shot. It, I think it'll be relatively important because it says here, um, new limited series helps launch an all new Superman status quo, setting up story mm -hmm. elements that reverberate across both action comics and Superman's Son of Kal-El in the months to come. So, that's so interesting. I think it might be potentially an essential read for continuity. I wonder, like, I wonder if is there something planned with Morrison Superman wise? Not that he's replacing out of those two books, and I'd be mad if he did because those runs are just really getting started. But is there a plan for another super book of some kind that Morrison's going to keep doing, or is he just like jumping in here because he thought this would be a fun thing to do? Yeah, I suspect the latter. I know he's mm -hmm. dabbled with the authority before. Um, I think he's a big fan, uh, so I think he kind of probably jumped at the chance, uh, if anything. But I mean. Who knows? Yeah, you know, he he always says, "Oh, I'm done with superheroes," and then there's one more book, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm done with superheroes. Oh wait, I've just fallen into a pit of like fifty oh. superheroes. We're gonna <laughs> we're happen? gonna uproot the Green Lantern for a couple years because I'm <laughs> done with superheroes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the thing is, because he sells and right. has such you know uh, a name behind him at this point, uh, you know, editorial will shift anyone off a book for him. Yeah. Uh, which takes out the Action Comics 1033, which is a couple of uh, nice covers. And uh, notably, there was a change pointed out. You can't see it in the solicits here, uh, but I did see it this week. Uh, they've slightly redesigned the Action Comics logo, starting with this issue. Uh, it's got the same sort of general idea, but it's a bit more sleek and, the, the, you know, the line that goes across is a bit, you know, it's more stylish. Mm. Uh, just okay. a slightly updated. Not a big deal, but worth mentioning. Uh, and this is still Johnson writing this book, uh, which is cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and this does indeed have a backup. Um, it's the same Midnighter one. Yeah. Yep. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's sneaky in there about the backup. So, yeah. But that's still $5 40 pages, so I mean, that looks like it should have a backup. Uh, right. Just at the glance. But uh, So that's cool. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to have a Taylor Superman book and a Philip Kennedy Johnson yeah. Action Comics book at the same time. Oh, me too. And all three of those have a Bartel uh, 1 to 25 variant uh -huh. that kind of form like a, a group. They're all of the same like, Almost style. Almost like a triptych. Mm. Yeah. Very nice. I like all of them. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. Uh, so there you go. Uh, we have Static Season 1, Issues 1 and 2. Um, although the first issue isn't actually a July issue. They're sort of like retroactively soliciting this for June. Yeah. So it's not double shipping. It's just um, sort of getting this first issue yeah, in all the late. because this was delayed because it was going to be a digital first or digital yeah. only and they kind of you know re rejiggered their plans due to retail around <clears throat> cry retail around <laughs> cry apparently there's a there's buzz they might be doing the same with Zdarsky's justice league as well yeah we, we oh, that'd be that cool. last week. yeah 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 uh so that's a uh, via alia uh, on that so uh cool if you're looking forward to that uh, art by Chris Cross. Well, actually, sorry. Layouts by Chris Cross and finishes by Nicholas Draper Ivy. Very specific there, but uh, mm -hmm. worth mentioning. That's what they've put down. Uh, then, similar vein, we have Icon and Rocket, Season 1, Issue 1, uh, which is uh, Reginald Hudlin writing with Doug Braithwaite on the on the art. So, also coming in July. And then we have something completely new, and we have DC once again dabbling into the horror comics, which I am delighted by this. I mean, even though this one is a bit of a tie-in to a thing, um, they did specifically point out when they announced this that they have more horror books they want to announce as part of this line in July for October. So we're going to be getting a, an October batch of horror books again. This, which is Yeah, neat. this is exciting. This kind of feels like the next step after Hill House. Maybe 
Mm -hmm. Maybe because he's not as directly involved in these, but yeah, they, they saw the success of that line, well, we could do something with that. Yeah, I've got a feeling we may even still see Hill House again, but this is like, okay, well, that's like on hiatus for a bit. We're going to do just another batch of DC Horror books. You, and it's just it's just called you, DC Horror, this line. Um, notably, it doesn't say Black Label in the front, which I think is a bit weird. But yeah. Well, because yeah, it says DC Horror Presents, so it's almost like it's a whole yeah. sideline. You know, or, or maybe it's just not black label because this is meant to be more of a teen, like right. You know, uh, no, it's seventeen plus. What was it says it? on the cover. Oh, yeah. there. It says on yeah. the back. Um, it's just weird because we we do have still new black label books being announced, so it's weird to me that this isn't. You know, I can, it can still be DC Horror Presents, but just under black label. So, so it's a bit odd. The, the Tynan book that's coming out, what imprint was that on? That's black label. Is that black label? And yeah, because issue two is like uh, later in this, so I remember checking it yeah. again. Uh, so damn. So that's, it's a bit I weird. Maybe that was the the back door, you know. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. retroactively, that would have been DC Horror. But this presents. is a uh, five issue book. This is actually DC Horror presents the Conjuring the Lover issue one. This is actually a prequel lead in to the Conjuring three that's coming out mm -hmm. this year. Now. Yeah. Uh, I'll check this out, and, you know, I enjoy those movies well enough. Um, admittedly, yeah. I am more excited for non-tie-in stuff later, but... Sure. Honestly, it's a bit of a surprise to me that Warner hasn't done much of this before. Yeah. You'd think they would have done, right? Because, why not? They own them both. <laughs> I love the idea that the doorbell goes and Matt checks his phone. <laughs> I do, because I have, I have a ring doorbell, so... Ah. And now the person is gone. Very fancy. Matt's I'll rewind got, it. It's got Matt's got that Oracle Watchtower like security system all I, set up. I do sometimes. Yeah, uh, we have a backup story in this as well by uh, Scott Snyder, uh, with art yeah, by Dennis. Which, uh, him returning John. to his four roots is pretty cool. That's neat. Uh, and what's, it's worth mentioning this is a four dollar book with a backup, so they they're, they are pricing this slightly less than the mainline books in that sense. Uh, this this also says thirty two pages. Oh, oh, maybe it's just a shorter main story. <laughs> Never mind then. I wonder if they're maybe, because they've done this in the past every so often, um, not put ads in for certain issues. Ah, possibly. To kind of like, uh, Image do this a lot as well, actually, with especially with first issues, where they'll do no ads, you know, just so it's still the same page count in the solicits, but works out like, well, you know, you've got more story. Yeah, the variant there for this, which is just the black, white, and red cover, I think, mm -hmm. so kind of nice. Um. Yeah, I'll check this out. I'm looking forward to looking at this. Even though I am, I'm definitely more excited for original horror stuff that will come in October. Uh, that said, though, if they do a whole line where everything's like, you know, like here's a horror comic series based on other properties that Warner Brothers own. What else do they own? Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, because mm -hmm. uh, they own New Line. They technically own Friday the Thirteenth, but obviously that's in a bit okay, of a basically pickle. go look at the first yeah. four or five deceased variants. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, Tim pointed out too that this might mean that they might be reprinting some of their older horror stuff mm. that was through Wildstorm or Vertigo, one of the two. Which Probably that, I, guess. I know, I, I know Jason Aaron did a a two part Friday the Thirteenth story that is impossible to track down. So yeah, I mentioned that's pretty exciting. I mentioned the backup. So the main story is David L. Johnson, uh, Mick Goldrick, and Rex Ogle. Uh, mm -hmm writing art by jerry brown what's interesting is that it says here two-page ad art by dave johnson so uh, is that like an in-universe like ad that takes up two pages that they've got like comic art for Maybe. that's interesting <laughs> Maybe. possibly yeah. interesting I, specify I that like, and solicit i i do like the synergy of this though because warners does know that like conjuring is one of the bigger franchises right now right like so for sure why definitely. not yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, i mean i i think i mean what else do they have going right now you know, I mean, not really. They have like what well, DC movies that may or may not be good. There's supposed to be another one of those yeah. Harry Potter prequels coming out at some point. But... Yeah, yeah, but that's what I mean. So, like, that's that, that's cool. I think that they're branching out to comics. Oh, they, they got see enough of a market there. Matrix you know? is coming back this year. To be fair, so I suppose I'll give it <laughs> give them that. Sure. And they just had Godzilla vs Kong, so they do have stuff this year. It's not like yeah. there's nothing coming from one. Yeah, of but those. didn't feel like Godzilla v Kong is, was like a. That's the last one for a minute. Well, like, it did feel that way until it actually made more money, despite the fact that we're in a pandemic yeah. in the last one. So it, we might yeah. actually get another one now, Matt. I mean, that, that's very exciting. I'm just saying from a storytelling standpoint. I mean, hey, if they want to do tie-in comics to that, I know the licenses are all over the place. 
yeah. for those. Oh yeah, but that's. I mean, who's who's that been with? Is IDW had that for a long time? IDW Boom had them. Well, for yeah, a bit as well. Johnson has that one that that's Kong, I think, out of the apes or something. Because because Warner Bros. do not have. It's not even. I think it's legendary have licensed Godzilla rights from Toho in Japan. True. So, yes, right. so Toho in Japan are the ones who have licensed out comic rights to whoever. Legendary actually and, have their own comics imprint as well, right? Because didn't Warner's Grant pick Morrison up did Legendary? A few stories for them. No, no. Uh, there, there was a kerfuffle when they wanted to put things straight onto HBO Max, uh, right. and they almost sold Godzilla V's comic to Netflix when they were fighting with Warner's, but they seemed to work it right. all out. So they okay. still got a relationship. Gotcha. Uh, that's good. And I still don't have my Bond film. No, that's, oh, that's a shame. Someone Which posted that. Really I, I heard well. a delightful rant this week. I didn't listen to all of it, but how James Bond's a really shit spy because he tells everyone his name. Uh, and I, everyone knows that. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, not maybe he's deal. just so confident in his skills that he doesn't care. He's terrible. It's anyway, a double bluff. So uh, it's always a double bluff. This, uh, so this, uh, this is all, another one of these backdated ones. So the first issue, this is actually a June issue. And issue Which two is when the movie actually comes out, right? Yeah, and issue two is coming out in July. I actually like because it's like an old paperback cover. Uh, they've got like it's like an old book sitting on a table. I think it's meant to be a VHS. Oh, it's a VHS. Sorry, I didn't scroll. Look, I'll be honest. The images on this stupid solicitor are so big, so goddamn big. That I didn't see the bomb. So uh, yeah, this uh, says VHS. I, I will the bomb. let you off because the only reason I can see them all out in one go without needing to scroll for the other half is because I have it on my vertical monitor rather ah, than there my you normal go. one. So issue two is out in July. Issue one is actually out in June. So again, it's another back that he'd solicit. Uh, different, uh, different people on the backup story in the second yeah. issue. There is one. Um, sure. Shay Grayson and uh, John Ferrer uh, on yeah. art. And Ferrer's a great. I've not seen his art in a while. I'm happy to see that. Uh, oh, that's a good. So it check looks like the backups are are going into the Warren's haunted artifact room from uh, Annabelle Comes Home. Ooh. So so that nice. that'll be fun. I, I want to know more about some of this. So yeah, that's cool, that's cool. Some non-superhero stuff to look at in the show uh, later in the year is always fun. Uh, Suicide Squad Get Joker Issue 1. This is a three-issue black label prestige book by Brian Azzarello with art by Alex Maleev and Matt Hollingsworth. I have to admit, Maleev's name does make me a little more interested than I was, otherwise would be. I mean, I, I mean, I'm interested in every single name there. Azzarello, love it. Maleev, finally something I can read that's not with Bendis. Yeah. I'm there <laughs> for it. And Hollingsworth has some fantastic colors. So I actually, I'm um, yeah, I don't know who Hollingsworth is, which is why it's the only reason I didn't mention he's him. He's a colorist. Yeah. Okay, he's a colorist. Uh, so this is uh, actually a slightly advanced solicit. This is actually the start of August. This is cause these solicits are all over the place. So this is the start yeah. of August. This is coming out. Uh, it's a three issue prestige book. So it's a uh, forty eight page, seven dollars, but it's prestige plus format. So it's the bigger pages with a different format. Yeah. And, all that jazz. I, I would have said I would expect this every other month, mm -hmm. but a uh, website who we don't like to give credit to yeah. has actually been talking about this very specific book from Azarello for about two years now. So it may just all be done. Uh, it, it might well be, yeah. Yeah. Or at the very least, they're so far ahead that it's possible, yeah. yeah. Uh, so let's get, I'll read the description for this then, since it's a completely new uh, thing. Critically acclaimed best-selling author Brian Azzarello and Eisner award winning art legend Alex Maleev collaborate for the first time in this three-issue oversized Prestige Plus format. Suicide Squad series pitting Red Hood, Harley Quinn, Firefly, and more of DC's most villainous... I like Firefly being in there, actually. That's a nice pick. Uh, against the Joker. When Task Force X Amanda Waller sets her sights on Batman's greatest foe, she enlists the Dark Knight's former partner Jason Todd to track down the clown prince of crime and put an end to his mad reign of terror. Do you know, I actually, that makes sense. Yeah, I kind of like the idea that Jason's brought in, not as a criminal with a bomb in his neck, but he's brought in as like, the, the, the the straight guy to lead them because he's not a complete... He's the, the Rick Flag. Yeah, he's not a complete psycho that, you know, the rest of them are. Uh, yeah, and, and he definitely knows the Joker. It's like, hey, you've got insight on this. Yes, and obviously it's out of continuity because Harley Quinn would make no sense in continuity right now to be on that team. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I mean, it's fine. It's a black label book. Yeah, it's a black label. Yeah, but uh, just worth worth mentioning. Uh, so cool. Um, very neon cover as well with the uh, the Joker colors with the greens and the pinks. Yeah, I'm here for that. Apparently, there's a variant by uh, Fornes, which I don't think they've. Nah, it's not there yet. Yet, but is probably stunning. Oh, it's probably lovely. Probably. So there you go. We got a new prestige book. Uh, not in July. <laughs> this is the start of August, but. Uh, 
That's what that's when that's happened. Uh, we have the Batman Catwoman special issue one. We knew this was coming. This is a break in the Tom King book, uh, presumably to give uh, uh, a man, Clay Man, Clay has a uh, his break <laughs> to catch up. Uh, but no worries because this special is Jean Paul Leon on art. Obviously, Tom King still mm-hmm. writes a six dollar forty eight page book. Uh, honestly, Leon's name on this is like that's all I need. Because I, I, he did that two page, or sorry, two page, that two arc, the two issue arc in Detective during the New 52, and I loved it. And I was like, yes, give me more of this guy. Uh, I don't remember that. That was good. Yeah, there was, uh, was, it was in the middle of a run. There was like a two issue break in the middle of a run. It was okay, but that two issues was great. But anyway. Well, during the New 52, it started with Layman. So if it was during that one. It wasn't. It was, uh, it was whoever was after that. Yeah, they had a break for two issues, and it was Jean Pierre Lon on R, and I can't remember who was writing those two issues, but uh, it was really good. Um, so that's cool. Obviously, if you're reading Batman Catwoman, this is just a nice. This is a you got to pick it up anyways. Yeah. But, <laughs> so and but, also yeah. that Lee Weeks variant. I, I didn't actually check the variant. Let's have a look at the variant. Uh, I think. Is that not the oh, first right. one, not the Lee oh, Weeks? It's, it's by the look of it. Yes, yes, that is Lee Weeks variant. The other one, the other one's actually not bad either. The painted one. But, yeah. uh, cool. Uh, something we already talked about, so I'll just, you know, quickly list them here. Batman Secret Fails Huntress issue one, uh, which is out at the end of July, and Batman Secret Fails The Signal issue one, which out, is out early uh, mm-hmm. July. So that is cool. Uh, and then next up, this was something that was announced this week, and... I can I can just see Matt uh, the smile coming from his little happy he, face. He's, he's scrolled ahead. He's knows he knows what it is now. And he's excited, yeah. and, and I am too, Matt. I'm right here with you. Yeah, yeah. So this is Blue and Gold issue one. This is a eight issue mini series written by Dan Jurgens, art by Ryan Sook, which is a good good get. Uh, this yeah. is eight issues of well Blue Beetle and Booster Gold. Yeah. I mean, can, can, it's can about I... <laughs> them tackling social media. I believe was the the pitch. <laughs> uh, so, regardless of anything else, Matt is going to be over the moon for this for eight months. Yep. Uh, starting in July. So, also that uh, Dave Johnson variant, which is the the main one, the the playing card, the, the first one. Yeah. yeah. Shows. Oh, love it. Uh, that's that's first fun stuff. Yeah, I actually like the main cover. The Ryan Stuck main cover, I think, is also quite nice. Oh yeah. Uh, that cover. Alien invaders repelled. Justice League saved. Uh, about time we get our own book. Uh, I can't wait for Joe, this. Joe, I'm liking this trend of them not trying to do ongoings and just saying, no, let's do full eight or ten issue books on characters. Yeah. And if they do well, they can get a second season. You know, but they're not trying to. I would to much rather things. have an eight issue series of Blue and Gold than <laughs> the state we've been in for the past, I don't know, ten years. Yeah, you know, six issues of a book that was supposed to keep going of Blue and Gold that then doesn't get finished. You know, like, this is the yeah. better method uh, if this is what makes them work. Uh, so, yeah, so, so Matt is delighted. And honestly, yeah, I mean, I, I I will give this a fair shot. I, I like the characters well enough. Um, More Blue and Gold talk of a sort uh, later when we talk about The Flash. But uh, mm-hmm. uh, next up, Justice League Infinity issue one. This is something we were... Uh, Mentioned earlier, right? Was this the one we talked about earlier? A little bit? No, you're thinking of the no. Zarsky one. I'm the Zarsky. That's, that's a different name. That's a okay. different one. This is a continuation of Justice League Unlimited, the, the cartoon. Ah, yeah. This is a seven issue miniseries that follows that continuity with uh, GM DeMatis and James Tucker writing with Ethan Beavers on art. Um, uh, James Tucker was uh, you know, writer and producer on the, that show. Sure. So it, presumably he's there coming in with the ideas and then. Uh, the Maris is kind of converting that into a comic script. Yeah, this is neat. Um, it's probably a low priority for me. I think out of everything, it, it falls in line. We've got the the animated adventures yeah. continues. We've just had a bunch of that. There's, we, you know, we've got coming up the the Batman eighty nine and the the Superman one, right? I yeah, think it's coming. Yeah, so it's like it kind of falls amongst those where we've had a lot of these continuations of stuff and. Most of them, I'm sure, are pretty solid and neat, but I rarely feel the need to check them out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that is that. Uh, then we got Shazam issue one. It's a four issue mini series, and it is by Tim Sheridan, who's doing Teen Titans Academy. So presumably, this will be tying into that uh, over the course of it. Uh, art by Clayton Henry on this. Mm-hmm. Um, 
variant covered by Gary Frank is a nice thing to see, it's, though. No, the, the Steve Lieber variant, though, is the most... I, I didn't know that Lieber had this style in him. Is that it's the black like and white? Those, uh, yeah. 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 It's like one of those ones when you're watching a history documentary, and they're <laughs> like, you know, they pull it yeah. from an old manuscript. Right, so, don't get me wrong, the, the Gary Frank cover is, is great. It's every Gary Frank yeah. cover I mean, yeah, I mean, Shazam standing on what looks like a volcano. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it looks yeah. great. It, it does. But it, I wish I cared just... about this story, though. I mean, it's hey. Hard to, uh... It's hard to care as someone who, one, didn't read Teen Titans Academy, uh, not read Suicide Squad, and also really didn't like what they were doing with Shazam in the future state. Uh, stuff, I'm, so. I'm still in for issue two at Teen Titans Academy. If I'm still reading Teen Titans Academy in July, then I'll read Shazam issue one. If I'm not reading Teen Titans Academy in July, if I've already dropped it by then, then I'm not reading this. So that's kind of. Apparently, um, false. it doesn't really say in the solicit text, but in some of the other mm. press release stuff, they talked about how it's kind of a uh, essentially uh, Billy Batson puberty is is the story. Okay, I'm not against that as an idea. Uh, okay, uh, for some reason, next is the Batman Fortnite Zero Point hardcover. Uh, yeah, for some reason being, it is the best selling comic in most stores this past week. Aye, mainstream yeah. trash. Okay. Mainstream and has trash. a hardcover collection, including a bonus code code unlocking seven DC themed Fortnite digital items. Look, so... I, I know <laughs> Matt barely understands us, what you're saying. He's just none saying none of it. us care about Fortnite. <laughs> none of us care about Fortnite, and that's fine. But if this gets people into comic stores, this gets people onto you know, especially you know, younger people who play Fortnite, and then onto DC Universe Infinite, which is where they're also giving away codes, and gets them to check out other stuff. That is only a good thing for us. I all right. I don't know, but it doesn't mean I want to talk about it though. I'm not dismissing its existence. I just don't care. You kind of are. I don't want to talk about it. All right. <laughs> I don't have to pay attention to it. I'm just like, fine. It exists. If it gets people into comics, then great. But I'm not going to pretend to give a shit about it. <laughs> like, I'm not doing that. Wait, wait till Tynan uses one of the Fortnite characters in his Batman run. And I'll be sending a harshly worded tweet to Mr. Tynan mm -hmm. expressing my. My disinterest. You won't even know it's a Fortnite character. I won't know. <laughs> Unless they make it abundantly clear, like when he shows up as like a Fortnite pun or something. <laughs> he does like the L dance. I wouldn't recognize that, but yeah, sure. What's an uh, L dance? Uh, you know, the, just the, it's it's you know the the Fortnite dancer, you know, just the the loser thing, and they do a bit of a dance I with it. I don't know. No. You'll you know you would recognize if you saw it because it was okay. all over. Especially you, Matt. You, you know we. With the, the, you know, the, with your workplace, you will definitely have seen yeah. it. <laughs> I just know the floss, and I never want to see that BS again. Mm. Mm. Ever. Uh. How does it translate to a comic, that one, I think? Without yeah. multiple panels. Ah, uh, Fortnite is the worst. Okay. Uh, oh, what's next? Uh, Joker Harley Criminal Sanity hardcover. It's nice that that's finally finishing. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm actually curious to go back and read it uh, when it's all done, because I, 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 I fell away because it was like the, the release schedule became so wonky yeah. that uh, it was hard to keep up with uh we got a couple of the young graphic novels uh we got teen titans beast boy loves raven so it's the piccolo and cami garcia book yep yep uh, and then we have unearth the jessica cruz story which is cool that's uh that's lillian riviera and steven mm -hmm. c on art so or sorry steph c i don't know why i said steven yeah, yeah steph mm -hmm. c uh I'm blaming Matt for, uh, he said something over me, like I couldn't, my brain That's wasn't right. thinking. So, I'll just blame Matt. And there's what, Wonderful Women of the World, uh, which is a Wonder Woman, uh, but, well, she's on the cover at least. So they got various yep. listed for story and pencils. It's an anthology series celebrating noteworthy women from around the world. Uh, uh, yeah, interesting. Cool. You know, um, mm -hmm. uh, Best-selling author, Laurie Hulls Anderson gathers women and non-binary writers and artists to reveal the women making our world uh, day by day, uh, real world heroes from the fields of business, activism, science, and pop culture. That's interesting. So, is, is this like straight up comic stories, or is this something so it looks a, like a little different? Because it says yeah. story and pencils by various. So yeah, I'm just I'm just wondering, like, are, are these fictional stories, or I guess what I mean, rather than are they comics, are, are they fictional stories about these various people, or are they actually just telling the true stories of these various people? Uh, it could be a mix and match. Yeah, I'm yeah. curious. Uh, it seems like a neat idea, especially for something to give young readers. Uh, yeah. Sounds like a really good idea. Uh, American Vampire 1976 issue 10 is coming out, so that's trucking along. Uh, we have Batman issue 110. 
by, uh, of course, James Town IV and Jorge Jimenez, so that's going along just fine. Um, like he's fighting John Walker. With like a a, almost Hawkman-esque mask. Not the horns, but like the the nose I'm looking at. He's got like a sort of Hawk mask. Seeing seeing the flag and the armor, I was just like, it's, you know. Can we talk about that jock variant, though? Uh Uh-huh. Okay, I'll look at the jock variant. Oh, it's a very pretty cover. I I will will, will (laughs) concede such a thing. Uh, We have Batman Superman 20. uh, Jin Lu Yang continuing that. Very cool. Uh, Batman Reptilian issue 2, continuing the new black uh, label book by Ennis and Liam Sharp. Mr. Freeze can't catch a break. <laughs> Tried to get groceries last time. <laughs> yeah. No. Some reptilian monster has kidnapped him and hung upside down. <laughs> Sam for a snack. At least he knows he'll know be cold. Oh, dear. Um... <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest I think I glossed over that that was even Mr. Freeze because obviously the art style is very it like, just kind of blends into yeah. the, the horror around him yeah. but yes yeah, so that's definitely Mr. Freeze's dome and his, yep. his eyes uh, Batman The Adventure Continues Season 2 Issue 2 uh, so that's continuing along Batman The Detective Issue 4 uh, which is uh, 4 of 6 on Taylor's Mini Batman Urban Legends Issue 5 uh, this will be interesting to look at the following month because we'll have a rep- replacement for one of the ongoing books. But there is a Batgirl story in this one, uh, which may be a one yeah. and done. It doesn't actually kind of indicate which way or the other. But... I think it's going to be the Bennett story because uh, I know, you know I know all the other ones. Yeah, so. yeah probably. Do that if it's Martin, but I do love how they just break no, it down. It's Martin's doing the Tim Drake one. Did, uh, okay. last month. Was Bennett okay. the one who did the Batgirl story in that Future State? I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Mixed expectations then. But Yeah, I just I just love how they just break it down in here by the character. Redhead, Grifter, Tim Drake, Batgirls. Like perfect, it looks. perfect hey, presentation. It's, it's conc- concise, you know exactly what it means. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no confusion. Uh Catwoman issue thirty three, continuing that run, really cool. Um big stuff going down with Valor Valley going by the cover. Uh, Challenge of the Super Sons issue 4, that's trucking along. Checkmate issue 2, just to remind everyone that that's back. Uh, we're finally getting the uh, Bendis and Maliev checkmate story. So, that's coming. Uh, Crime Syndicate issue 5 is out in July. Uh, we got Crushing Lobo issue 2. Detective Comics 1039 and 1040. Uh, the three double shipping books from June seem to be double shipping again in July. Uh, I'll mention those when we get there, but... Uh, that does seem to be a continuing Interesting thing. Interesting, with the, the backup still changing again. Uh, Tristan Jones doing the backup in 39. And then uh, Dan oh, Waters yes. and Kyle Hawks doing the, the backup in 1040. Are these um, one and dones, or are there two ongoing stories that are alternating in the backups? Uh, they sound like one and dones, to be honest. They're not one and dones. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Just curious. Uh, Future State Gotham issue three. Uh, this is this awkward point where we haven't had issue one yet, but it's been the solicits mm-hmm. a few times. It's always it's always yeah. been issue fours and solicits. We've just had issue one. We can actually talk about it a little bit, <laughs> give an opinion. But that's still trucking along. Green Lantern issue four, uh, heavily featuring Joe Mullen on the cover here, uh, which is cool. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, Connor wasn't here for issue one of Green Lantern, was he? No, I was not. No. Yes. Uh, how did you feel about Green Lantern issue one? I haven't read it yet. Oh yeah, well, fair enough then. That's it. I keep putting it off because I was just not, I'm just not that excited to read it. Well, I'll Matt, Matt was it. very enthusiastic about it. I'm, I, I loved honestly, it. I was shocked when I saw his reaction to that because most of the internet seemed to be pretty underwhelmed by it at most. I, so, I mean, I'm, I'm not, not, not that I'm saying it's bad, but just general impressions seem to be like, eh, that's fine. Yeah, I see a lot of potential. I wasn't as over the moon as Matt was, but I see a lot of potential uh, in there. So, uh, I mean, I will. I, I do intend on reading issue one still at some point before issue two. Whether or not that actually happens is mm. it remains to be seen. Then Connor's favorite artist is back with Harley Quinn issue five. Uh, so oh, Hugo Strange looks so weird. <laughs> Everything by Ross looks weird. But that um, one's like a bald guy with a big beard. It's hard to make that look that weird, and he managed it. <laughs> Infinite Frontier issue two and issue three. Uh, so this is like the one other double shipping thing that's been added. But I'm going to be honest, I actually kind of like events double shipping. I like the events to feel a bit more condensed, just to make them feel more eventy. I guess does that make sense? 
Yeah, unless mm -hmm. it's a big event with like tie-ins every week, so you've sure. got something consistent. Uh, I, I agree. I like it getting through a, at a nice pace. Yeah, so Zermanic was on both issues, which maybe implies that, you know, that they got ahead on this, uh, which is cool. So, this is Williamson written event again, 40 pages, both both issues. Um, very much looking forward to seeing what they do with this. Uh, there's covers for the first issue, at least. Maybe both, actually. They may just all be bundled together. Uh, but, there you go. So, that's Infinite Frontier issue 2 and 3. So, uh, Which is funny, because I almost forgot that was a thing. I almost forgot that starting in June. Uh, and then we're going straight into you know, two of them in, in July. But, there you go. Uh, Justice League 64, with a fairly pretty cover uh, with all those uh, hawks and silhouette well one hawk it's gorgeous, and yeah. various other aliens but mainly a hawk uh so that's also double shipping but that wasn't june as well that's not a surprise uh same S sumit kumar on the it says r i'm assuming that's the back part with rambi i would imagine yeah. so yeah i mean if we've got to take a break from zamanico kumar's a yeah. great choice yeah yeah Bendis and pew i think so i think pew um Tweeted out, he's working on 64. He is a solid filling eyes for Marquez, yeah. I would say. Uh, some very nice covers across some of these as well. Uh, worth mentioning, uh, one of those covers there for the second issue, uh, Coley's tying into Checkmate uh, mm -hmm. with that cover. So, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so Ben just having some synergy there. Uh, Justice League Last Ride, issue three. This is the Zarsky one, uh, which was mentioned there. This is issue three of seven. Uh, coming in July, which obviously we're looking forward to because it's Arsky doing Justice League, and he's actually doing a good Red Hood story right now, which means he can basically do just about anything. Uh, so, cool. Legend of the Dark Knight issue 3 is next. This is Dark Robertson uh, to start with. I think he's I think he's on like the first four or five, and then it's shifting to a new... This team. this says it's uh, drawing to its conclusion, so it might just be three. And oh, it might just be three. Next yeah. But I remember seeing like a... Sound, uh, like a a blurb from DC. It was like, oh, the first three issues with this team. So, which heavily implied it's shifting to, which yeah. to be fair, that was the whole, that was the way Legends of the Dark Knight operated back when. You know, if you go back to those early stories, it was like an arc from a team and then it moved on to another team. Even when they brought it back uh, a few years ago when they did it as a, a digital series, that was just like, it was anthology of like, here's different teams on, on each issue. And there so. was a lot of good arcs in that initial Legends. Obviously, some of the ones in between weren't as good, but you had, you know, the early stories of, you know, the Venom from, uh, that was the Morrison story, I think, maybe. No, no, that was not. He did Gothic. But there was, you know, there was various stories that sort of introduced things early in Batman's career that were really cool. So, uh, again, it's not actually started yet, so we'll see next month uh, how issue one fares. But, it's the sort of thing that we might check out, if even if we don't like that first issue. Maybe by the time issue four comes around, yeah. and it's, it's a new team. Maybe check it, that out. It's effectively an ongoing book of miniseries. And that means every time there's a new story with a new team, there's a reason to, to look at it again. Mm. Uh, Mr. Miracle, The Source of Freedom, issue three, continuing that miniseries, three of six. Uh, Nightwing, 82. Uh, what is to say, except that is one of the best things going right now, so happy days. <laughs> happy days indeed. Robin, issue four, Williamson's run on uh, Damien, continuing. Cool stuff. Also, a different artist already. Um, I'm surprised that Melnikov is taking a break after only three issues. Uh that's fair. Yeah. Um, so that's a nice rose cover, actually, though. Uh, Ooh, that is nice. Yeah. Yeah. Is a maniple. Yeah, and then you got Rorschach issue ten. Uh, gearing up to the end of that. Well, just a couple left. Ruby Justice League issue four is after that. Sensational Wonder Woman issue five. That's collecting the digital first series. Strange Adventures issue 11, so that's another one that's even closer to the end for Tom King come summer. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, of course, got great covers as always. Suicide Squad issue 5, really, really focused on that Peacemaker character. <laughs> I can't possibly yeah, I imagine why. why. <laughs> also, it looks like he's going to Earth 3 to, to take out some uh, crime syndicate. Uh, yeah, it does look like that, doesn't it? That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh... The variant's actually kind of pretty, actually. It's just the uh, the, the Trinity of Earth 3. Uh, it's all right. Yeah. Uh, there we have Supergirl Wonder Woman issue... Sorry, Su Supergirl Wonder of Tomorrow issue 3. Two. Wonder of Tomorrow. Issue 2. Yeah. Do you know what? I'm, I'm getting thrown off here. Uh, <laughs> clearly mid-thought. Yes, Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow issue 2. 
uh, which I'm also looking forward to. So as much as a couple of Tom King books are coming to an end, another one has just begun. Uh, Superman Red and Blue issue 5, uh, that's still going. Teen Titans Academy issue 5, uh, more of the Red X story going. The Dreaming Waking Hours issue 12, coming out. The Flash 772 is coming out. Uh, it's a great cover. Um, it's actually a pretty good cover. Yeah. Yeah, neat. Uh, only one cover to look at there for that one. Uh, that said, The yeah. Variants by Brett Booth, so maybe... Maybe that's just maybe a mercy. Maybe that, yeah. that is the good one. That's the mercy. Uh, Joker issue five. Interesting uh, that uh, Frank Avila's on art. Yep. <sighs> and Rosenberg's jumped in as a co-writer. Jesus, yeah. it's like they want me. They're like trying to pull and, me uh, back in. They've got uh, Sweeney Boo as the new ongoing artist for the, uh, Back for the backups. She's primarily done covers, um, but has dabbled mm. with interiors, I believe. Yeah, I mean, goddamn, Frank Avell and Rosenberg is, is a way to try and entice me back in, despite the it price is, point. But look at that, it's still five ninety nine. It is, yeah. So, screw them. If it was still four ninety nine digitally, I'd, I'd happily still be getting it, but, uh, but it isn't, so they can bite me. Uh, next, Batman Second Son Issue 4, wrapping up uh, the physical prints of that, mm-hmm. of that book, which is cool. Uh, and then the horror book uh, that we mentioned way, way, way back at the start of these solicits, uh, nice House in the Lake issue 2 uh, is coming out. Looking forward to this one. Uh, and then the other history of the DC Universe issue 5 is finally coming out, wrapping up that mini series. Oh, so wow. That's cool. And then the Swamp Thing issue 5, and I hate that all the this are dripped alphabetically. It infuriates me to no end. It is, yeah. Uh, but that's coming out, of course, and we're also, looking at it. Also, uh, a break issue. Uh, not Mike Perkins on art. We've got uh, John McRae. Uh, John yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm I'm sure. I'm sure they've they've thought about that in context of what the, st- the issue is, uh, for Probably, the story. Yeah. Uh, Tristan Justice issue six is coming out, and then Wonder Girl issue three again. Uh, issue three is that awkward issue where we've not quite had issue one yet. They've been teasing a bunch of variants this past week, and yeah. oh my god, all of them look. I want amazing. them all. Very pretty. I mean, the, these these covers here are stunning, but like all of the ones that have been shared. This past week, for you know, I presume, presume most of them for issue one, to be honest. Yeah, but oh, so good. And then Wonder Woman was the other double shipping book with seven seven five and seven seven six. Uh, Connor, yeah. you see, we're we're out of the Norse and into what looks like typical mythology. It does. It mentions a a whole pantheon of gods. It doesn't specify uh-huh. which gods, though. No. So very that's, interesting. Uh, pretty cool. And you got, you got fairies. In mm. Elfheim or Elfheim. So Yeah, not regretting my decision. Uh <laughs> Wonder Woman Black and Gold issue two is coming out. And then just to wrap up the solicitors, you got Looney Tunes two six one, Mad Magazine two three one, and uh, the Batman right. Scooby Doo Mysteries issue four. And that is it. That's your July solicitors. I would uh, I just let's say I'm just glancing at the teams on uh Wonder Woman Black and Gold. Sure. Uh there's a story in there by Tilly Walden who I absolutely love. She is utterly fantastic. Uh, that story alone has made me want to read this issue. Just that's in there. It's like, okay, that's worth the price of uh, price of entrance. And I'm seeing there's a story with Mikkel the Art, so I'm there for that issue. Well, uh, who who is she? Who is who is this Tilly? Uh, she's done a, a bunch of like uh, indie books. Uh, the one uh, that's just back there is uh, on a sunbeam, uh, which is a like it's a it's a wonderful like sci-fi adventure where it's it's in the future. It's it's a whole thing where it's like it's all women. But not like in this weird way. Just it's never mentioned in the story, and it, yeah, you probably took like two hundred pages to realize. But it's like it's it's like this sci-fi done by way of like Miyazaki with the art. Um, they have like koi fish as their ships. It's gorgeous. Uh huh. You think your car been the one with the uh, the audio degree? Would, I know. Would... I turned away. <laughs> I, I, I thought Mike would like lean, but I turned a bit further than I meant. Yeah. It went way off mic for like, I mean, it was only yeah, for half I a realized. sentence, but uh, I expect that from everyone well, else. I realized, but I didn't want to pick up the mic and kind of swivel it with me because that would be awkward, as I've just proved there. So, hmm. oh well, uh, it's on form, it's on form to end with Connor, uh, doing something wrong, I think. All I'm saying is that issue became worth checking out just based on those uh, creators. Sure, 
I mean, yeah, I mean, a lot of those uh, anthology books do have good teams uh, sprinkled throughout. Uh, but yeah, there you go, that's July Solicits, although notably with a few things retroactively put into June, and at least one thing put into the first week of, of August, but hey, whatever. Uh, we'll roll with it. So, that's what's coming up in the summer of 2021. Matt, your mic is clearly building up to do something, and I'm glad that I noticed that before you started speaking. <laughs> Would he have destroyed our air drums? <laughs> it sounded like an engine revving up almost uh, <laughs> when he wasn't even doing anything. <laughs> uh, Should have just clapped. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about books, shall we? Yes. Justice League issue sixty. Brian Michael Bendis writing with David Marquez on the art, and of course, uh, Connor has been forced to read this via Patreon. <laughs> so, yeah. so Connor has read this also. Um, I I really like this issue, Matt. How did you feel about it? It's 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 good. Um, I'm just I'm feeling at a point that this is just a stop for Bendis to keep telling the Naomi story until season two or whatever. And and that's fine, but never in a million years would I think that I'm I'm picking up Justice League physically, just for Justice League Dark, because if if this was just the story, it was just Bendis Marquez Justice League. I don't think I think I'll just go to digital to save myself some room. But um, fair, but yeah. fair enough. I thought this was better than issue one. Um, yes, definitely. It felt like a full issue. Like there was none of that. It felt like it just abruptly ended. I also. So, I, I was actively noticing how different Adam's voice was to everyone else mm-hmm. and just kept thinking about Connor's complaint that Bendis' characters all sound yeah. the same and how I just completely, all the rest dis- too. How I completely disagree with it. Uh, I still I still <laughs> feel like Bendis is writing for Wally and not Barry, but he's I guess not, it's just he, something we're going to have to deal with. He is not the only one guilty. Like, pretty much since the yeah. start of the New 52, so many writers yeah. who have written Barry have been guilty of that. So I, yeah, I, no, I know. But like, I expect more out of Bendis just because he's, he's Bendis and... You know, I'm trying to think of a, a version over at Marvel, but I really can't. There's not really a Flash. You know, you can't compare something like that. Is that on one to one? Yeah. I mean, we could. Do... I mean, when they do have legacy, they are distinct enough. You know, but like. Yeah. I mean, what are you going to do? Bring out Quicksilver to compare it to the Flash? Like, no, you know. No, again, that's not what I'm going to do because they're they're vastly different characters. But I'm trying to think of a legacy thing, but he really didn't. Outside of Miles and, and Peter Parker over the Ultimate, and then Riri Williams and, and Iron Man, Bendis really didn't handle Legacy over there, you know? So uh, it's hard to go one for one. Yeah, I guess so. Um, then again, though, Miles is one of the best examples of... Uh, but he and- was unique like Naomi is, right? Like, sure. Sure, yeah, you know, but... I don't know. I'm just I'm just trying to give him some credit where like the one one of his few examples is one of the yeah. most successful and, and also notable. The fact that that is one of probably I could count the amount of legacy true legacy characters in Marvel mm. on my fingers. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, you know, no, he only wrote one or two. Is but, it's not a terrible average. Yeah, because even even when they do do legacy, it's like Clint Hawkeye versus Kate Hawkeye. You're not going to write the same voice for those two characters, you know, because they both have different. I hope not. Yeah. yeah, they both have different viewpoints. Whereas I feel like people just love Wally and Barry together because they're from, you know, the Twin Cities in the middle of the DC. You know, also oh, just United uh, States. We're not moving on from this conversation without me mentioning Laura as a legacy character. But anyway, yeah, moving on. Kid. But uh, move, moving on uh, to actually talking about what's in Justice League here. Yeah. Um, so we ended last issue with Adam showing up to talk to Naomi, and immediately Superman shows up and grabs him. Because he's concerned. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> but clearly, it very quickly becomes apparent that they're both there for the same reason. They've both tracked, you know, this, this villain. Uh, was it Brutus? I think it's his name yes, was. Yep. Um, that he, he came from her world, and they want to talk to her. And the whole thing. And I think this is where the, the issue excelled for me. It, it is in the chemistry with the characters. It is in mm-hmm. the reactions from Naomi of, like, being, like, visited by these two characters. It is then in the reactions of the Justice League uh, when Superman says, hey, let's make Black Adam a member. <laughs> uh, you know, Oliver's reactions to a lot of this uh, were giving me some chuckles. I was having some yeah. fun with that stuff. And it feels very true that Ollie would feel that way. Be like, dude, you see the best in everybody. This guy's a villain. What are you doing? 
I mean, even just yeah. the fact that Black Adam's left off page, and then at the end of the, that first page, where they're all back at the you know uh, the Hall of Justice, yeah. and they're like, hey, we're going to talk about that, and he's about well, about what you know, Dinah says that, and then it just you know then it you know cuts to the panel of Black Adam just standing on his own yeah. away from everyone else. Uh, so he's pacing to the reveal, and he's pacing to, for the humor. Yeah. Uh, that's good. But yeah, you know, I you know I, I like this. Uh, I also love uh, the debating of like. What really, you know, I know I said I want different perspectives in the Justice League, but you know, um, oh, who's, what's the name he brings up? Uh, he says someone's been dying to get back on the roster. Oh, Blue Devil, that's who it was. Blue Devil. Yeah. yeah. That, that, I, I really pop for that, that when Barry says that. that mm-hmm. Like, this really gave me a chuckle. And even just the, the, uh, the humor of, like, Naomi waiting with Black Adam as they're having this discussion. And she's like, do you have super here? <laughs> and he's like, no. Yeah. But it doesn't take the wisdom of the hoodie to know what they're talking about yeah mm-hmm. uh so it was just odd giving them a moment of like uh mm-hmm. where, where they're kind of on the same page bizarrely because they're just like the polar opposites of yeah like, who's in this like issue mm-hmm. so no it was just interesting um putting all these these different things uh, together um but yeah so uh she she you'll know, recount some of her backstory in the, you know, the other world and all that um Brutus did reappear. Hippolyte is there in this massive crater when they go to get to mm-hmm. her. I did kind of love the little touch where Superman and Flash get there, and then the rest of the team show up, and Hippolyte is ready for combat. He's like, no, no, that's the rest of us. We're just much mm-hmm. quicker. So we, we always get here first. Mm-hmm. Uh, great detail. But Brutus attacked the Mascara, um, and he, you know, again, reiterates this idea that, oh, this world is worth fighting for. That, you know, that, that you know, uh, Oh, what was it? What's the name of the one that attacked Naomi? Uh, it's a really stupid oh, name. Zabado. Uh, Zabado. Maybe it's because yeah. it's got the word bad in the middle of it, and it made me. Yeah. It makes me roll my eyes every time I read it. But he's like, yeah, he is right. This world is worth fighting for. There is stuff here to, to do. Mm-hmm. And there's you know, some great full page spreads. You know, I think the art from uh, Marquez, unsurprisingly, is. Uh, His beautiful. expressions are on point. There's a page early on with uh, Naomi where when they're talking about who's on the team and whatnot, um, where it, it, they'd go from her home in Oregon to being in the, the Hall of Justice, where she looks super unsure, and mm. she looks even more unsure on the following. And there, it, it's not much, right? But Marquez just, like, nails it. So, yeah, even when we get to the end of the, the sort of the flashback, you know, to explain mm-hmm. the fight with uh, Hippolyta, where he makes this, you know, Brutus makes this portal uh, to yeah. this random spot, uh, in a city, and that's where the creator is. It's them falling through the portal and landing there. Uh, you know, the, the action's just really well told. It has a good flow to it. Um, it feels big. It feels bombastic. Um, you know, so even though the villain himself isn't all that interesting from a character perspective as of yet, he's just he's he's, mm-hmm. he's fine. Um, yeah. uh, but the action yeah. itself is really well done, and it's it's all the characters debating what to do about it. Uh, and I love that Hippolyta's reaction to Black Adam plays off all the winter endless winter yeah. stuff really well yep. so um so really yeah. cool. uh i also love when when hot girl or hawk woman hands I, I, naomi I think, it's, I think it's hot girl i think we're still on hot is girl is it still hot girl i think okay. so um she hands her the mace to see if the nth metal will react to her like it did to brutus and uh they go do you feel anything when you hold the mace she goes yeah i feel 14 percent cooler and then hot <laughs> girl's just like right that's like my every day like that that's some of the good, you know, Ben to see stuff that yeah. you like the banter. You that's know? like a prime example to me of like characters all sounding really similar. See, I disagree here though, just because of the Kendra that we've gotten, you know, like she's relating to this girl. It it's it's my promise it doesn't sound any different from Ollie earlier. And you know, you're praising Ollie, you know, it being kind of witty you know, earlier. It yeah. feels like the exact same kind of just dialogue to me. It like I, I could, I could have just swapped those characters mm-hmm. out, and the bubble just works. I don't think I don't think you could have. Yeah, why right? would all why would Oliver I mean, say that's my everyday? That doesn't make any not sense. Not in context of that specific <laughs> like moment, but it, I meant in the idea of just it sounds like something this Oliver would have said. I I, I, I mean. I get what you're saying. I like the wit that Bendis brings to a lot of his characters and the back and forth between them. But I also think that characters and ensembles in other comic books aren't as distinct mm-hmm. from each other as that your complaints about Bendis' these characters all sound the same would have you believe. I'm not saying everything has this problem. I, I just think he's one of the worst examples of it where 
Like there, there are scenes in this issue of you know the the legal standing around, you know, doing that. Debating. Yeah, and and I would agree there in those because you have to look at the bubble to who know who's talking because it is so indistinct. However, this is not one of those moments because again the you know it's not like Kendra's been a spitfire throughout. So I get what you're talking about, but here putting her at ease, you know. I think you know, it's, it's only the it's only the context of it being about the mace that makes right. it go. Okay, this is clearly I, the actual spirit of the dialogue mm, feels very just similar with one. everyone else for me. Um, I mean, honestly, this is something because every time we talk about Bendis, so a guy almost yeah. feels like it's even worth talking about all that much. But I, I just I think it's fine that his characters do all have a similar voice. Um, it would be a problem of every comic book had this same voice and there was no variety but because this is one or two Bendis books and a sea of other comics that all have very distinct styles, I am okay with this. I think this is a fun uh, I, I've always enjoyed Bendis' banter for the most part. There's obviously some weak examples here or there. Cause yeah, of course. Any writer does, but... I, just, I thought it was a fun moment with Naomi because if, if Bendis is just using this as an excuse to get Naomi over fine, you know have, have them relate to the young hero the best way they can so I mean, I think Naomi. I I think Naomi's already over anyway from her from her own book. But. Yeah, but like, here's my problem with with this is, you know, the people over at Marvel will talk about how he was forcing Riri Williams into Avengers and Iron Man and all this other stuff, and and here, any other book that he's touched, she showed up in. So it's it's Naomi, it's Action Comics, it's Superman, it's Young Justice, you know. And it's almost as if there's not a logical other than she's my character and I want to give her something to do, which it's fine because he's skilled at it. But like, here's just another yeah, Naomi I, I showing will say, up in the first arc. The page where she's kind of recapping some of her story. Yeah. That is a lot of exposition uh, in that page, uh, especially as someone who hadn't you know, read that story. Mm -hmm. I will it's say, I mean, it is fair to say that she's popped up in just about everything he's done. Um, yeah. at DC, I I don't mind it so much, in essence, because you're establishing this new character. It's kind of nice to have them in but different contexts. But I but I will say I think this Justice League is the most natural uh one to bring her into, mainly because the idea that she comes from this world with all these superpowered beings, the right. idea that some of those threats that may come through are big enough for the Justice League to need to deal with, it effectively sells. The concept of a whole world of superpowered beings that she came from. I, so I'm assuming right. the, the problem that the Matt has here is that it feels like the story was created to justify a reason to have Naomi in it. Like, oh, we're going to tell this story because I want to do a Naomi story in here, rather than, oh, she'd fit good in this it, story. Right. So it's like even when she popped up in action, like she's a welcome addition. Don't get me wrong, but cynically looking at it, it's just like, oh, this is Bendis's creation. Oh. And he wants to get her in as much as he can. I think and that's how I felt with Young Justice because we complained with Young Justice. Like this book is is looking for an identity, and then it kind of just became. I mean, yeah, but Naomi that was a problem with Young existence. Justice through and through. That wasn't just that part after of it. After the first arc, after the Gem World stuff, sure. But it's when she showed up, and then it was kind of searching for an identity. And now here, I feel like this Justice League. You know, young, I just feel young like, Justice never had an identity. That was a problem from day one with that book. I, I disagree from from the day one because the gem after because, the first start because, because the gem, the gem world world stuff was whatever. But anyway, I, I, before we move on to well, I want to address something Connor said. Con Connor huh? brought up uh, the you know, saying your complaint might be that it feels like this that start was created just to include Naomi rather than being something that could put her in. That's absolutely true. And I have no problem with that. I don't see what the issue is there, because the whole point of this story is that it's revolving around her mythology. Um, so, to, to me, it's like, well, that why is, why is that any less right, valid as a Genesis? Means that this is but why is that just holding her over till season two? Why is that any less valid as a as a genesis of an idea than anything else? It's not. I suspect it doesn't help that it's the first arc on it, so it hasn't established what his Justice League book is. It's just straight in with. This is a Naomi book that I mean, happens to feature the Justice League. Are you right. happy? I mean, because we know he's going to do a checkmate stuff in the second arc. Like, so are you, are you right. happy or unhappy about that? Me, uh, I'm, I'm happy with that because that's the stuff that I liked the most. I liked the Superman when it got to the Leviathan stuff. Mind you, the JRJR stuff, not not as much. Oh, obviously, but well, you know, I guess what I'm saying that's is where I feel he 
actually had a story that was fitting of the Justice League in, you know, like he did, he went deep down into the lore and pulled out, uh, you know, Manhunter and all that stuff, right? Like that's a Justice League story for me. I mean, so, I would say personally, I'm not thrilled that it's a Chipmate thing. It's not just I'm not reading it, but it's more, uh, you can kind of bring something in in your second arc. Uh, and so normally I'd be like, all right, fine, he's bringing in something else on his second arc. But again, it's because this arc is the Naomi arc already. Yeah. It's not. I need I need a core Justice League arc to set the baseline before we do other I, stuff. Admittedly, that question was more for just for Matt because he's the one with with mm-hmm. debating this uh, with yeah. me. But I mean, I I don't. I mean, if your complaint is that he's putting Naomi in everything, so she's being like around too much, or she's overexposed, or or whatever. I mean, that's, sure, I, I get maybe that complaint. Um. But given how positive we were on her book and how positive we were on her character, right? If, if, this, because, if the story's if the story's good, then why does it right, matter? But I feel like in in her own book where she gets to be the star instead of just a plot device, right? She's not just a plot device in her own book. We got to know, you know, like the whole stuff with her mom and her dad and those ties, you know, to her other world and you know in her friends, in her town, and what that all meant. And here, in Young Justice, and since we've seen her, she's just kind of like, oh, well, this energy matches her, so what, what can she tell us about going to there? Well, I mean, you again... Know, most, I don't feel like he's developing her most, in each subsequent... Most you characters know. in Young Justice had that problem, though. No, what, So many characters that never get any like development, really, right? There was one or two few right. who did. When it's his, but when it's his creation, and it's taking up, you know... Then use that time to develop her. There, what? Why? What are you just waiting for this for? You know, just don't use her as a plot device. And that's what I feel is going on every time she shows up. You know. I mean, if it like, feels why, like, if do you it feel... why she showed up in action? I don't actually, but <laughs> exactly, and that's part of the problem. So why was she there? Uh, I mean, I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. Right. But my so memory's that, bad, though. I, I forget stuff constantly about everything, even good stuff. Yeah, but see, that's not my point. My point is, if you're going to make a character be meaningful, you got to give him those moments instead of just sticking him in there. And I feel like he's just sticking him in there because my, her in there because it's his character. Yeah, I know. But what I'm trying to say here, though, is I don't think... I think the problem you're saying here about her, Naomi being shoved into here and only being a plot device... Would this be a problem if it was any other character, or is it just because it's Naomi that's yeah. Bendis' creation? I think it would be, because if, if this is the same character, like, if he had... Give, give me any other young hero, I, I right? don't know. I, so that's the thing, I don't know if I agree that you would. I, I think I think that if this was any other DC character who was shoved in here and we were going to use their mythology, whatever it may be, right, to whoever it was, if we were going to use their mythology to set up who the villain for this Justice League art was going to be, I think if it was a character you hadn't seen in a while, you'd just be happy that they're using their mythology for something. It wouldn't matter so that the character... It wouldn't if this matter... Is let, let me finish my point. It wouldn't matter that they're not necessarily advancing what their character is over the course of the story. You'd just be happy, oh, hey, it's cool they're using that corner of the DC Universe for something. Um, I, see, I, I, I disagree, because if this was Amethyst or the Dial H kid, take any of the young heroes from Wonder that he he jumped up outside the wonder twins because obviously i care a lot about them since the you know uh since since that book right but if that was them because you could easily make this amethyst and give her a sword and sorcery backstory that the justice league is investigating exactly so i would feel the same way i'm I'm falling asleep just thinking about it being amethyst (laughs) so that's my point so you could say like oh it could be any other character i would still feel the same because he's not developing them. They're just there as a plot device. I mean, is there any character in a Justice League book about, typically I think who's how been developed? Naomi has been outside of her own book. Again, does this not apply for most characters who pop up in team books, though? Right. I would but- say often they have a specific relationship with said character or team already, so it has impact for the characters I mean, them, whereas n- none of this justice like it, the fact that this is naomi doesn't matter to any of them except superman i guess who's no, it, met her before it doesn't right. but typically in any team story the story revolves around one or two characters who are having the main story and the main story here is clearly black adam it's clearly black adam's relationship with the others maybe hippolyta maybe we'll delve at that 
but certainly this the, the the actual focus the one who's been developed is black adam and in any team story typically it's one character or two who maybe get development not every character usually most of them are there because they're part of the team and they'll have a function in the action or they'll have a function from a plot device point of view or whatever but that's it um so i'm not actually saying you can't be mad or feel like naomi's been overused I'm, I'm or, or whatever I'm, but i'm happy that naomi's getting something to do i just wish it was more than just as a MacGuffin, right? Because here, what do they use her for? You get to the end, oh, we have to sink into her biosignature to go to her home dimension. Well, to, to, to be fair, Matt, the cliffhanger this you issue, know? which we've went way off track because you wanted to go on this this topic, but the end of this issue, she is separated from the Justice League and it's a cliffhanger, which presumably is going to be picked up. So with one right. issue of her inclusion, it's a bit weird at this point to make the assumption that, that she won't get any development. We don't actually know that, I, really. But with within two, I'm just talking about she was in the first issue. She pops up. At right? the very it's, end. Yes. Right, right, right. So, but again, it's, if this is when he's going to do it, great. Let me see it develop. But up to this point, I still feel the same way that she's just, you know, because again, <laughs> you can't remember why she was, why she showed up in action. We can already mention that Flash builds a fancy extension to his treadmill with, um, like, platforms for the rest of the league, uh, all with the symbols. Uh, and I'm pretty sure this is a Back to the Future reference when he apologizes for the uh, symbols not being to scale. Uh, did you get a Doc Brown? I apologize that it's uh, not painted <laughs> moment. Yeah, I, yeah. I kind of felt that. Uh, not sure why they all needed their own platforms, but sure. Yeah, because we just have Naomi's logo just hanging around. I mean, I get why that's to the Justice League. I get why they all have to have platforms. I just don't get why they all have to be labeled. Like, they could have just went right. And whatever. Black Adam, right? Yeah. Another person they just argued if he needs to be part of the team. Yeah, Flash built him a logo. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so maybe, maybe he's thinking, Ash is ammo used in the future. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. Captain Marvel will be back. He he can use that when Adam's not here. It's uh, it's fine. Um, so yeah, so Barry runs up. He can go with them. Uh, and then the cliffhanger is that Naomi, at the very least, is separate from everyone else. She's on her own. Um, are they all separate from each other? Is it just her that's stranded on her own? Uh, we won't know till next issue, but, uh, but you know, uh, tis what it tis. Um, I very much enjoyed this issue. Uh, I think the building of Black Adam's relationship with everyone else, Hippolyta's reaction to him, I thought advanced the, the key story they're telling there. Um, and building up the villains of Naomi's world is, is kind of interesting and seeing, you know, where that goes now that they're actually going to be over there. Because they go over there to to plug the hole, basically, that's being used to uh, teleport over. So Because they can only shut it from the backside, which makes sense. <laughs> that's, that's a funny, that's a funny sentence, man. <laughs> I, I know what I said. Um, because, or else Brutus will keep being able to, to port back in, or if he's working with Zambato or whoever, you know, um, you, gotta, you gotta go close it from the other side. Which I just watched something where that was a plot device, and I can't remember what it was. Maybe it was the Snyder Cut. I can't remember. I try to forget that one as much as possible. So if you really don't want this to be silly long, let's not talk about the Snyder Cut again. No, uh, no. Please, please, very please. Uh, I mean, Car Connor, would you, have you got thought she would like to share? <laughs> I think I should. To be honest, most of my thoughts um, in that I you know it's it's not like the worst thing ever. I think it's tedious for me to read because everyone sounds the same, and that is a key complaint. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned specific examples, and the the Naomi thing. I, I just you know I, I need a, be, a a benchmark to, to to start with before we start twisting on it. Um, it's it's frustrating to me that there's probably going to be at least two arcs. It's pretty, so it's not going to be until like the third arc till we get okay. This is what a regular Justice League story from Bendis looks like. That that's just weird to me. Because uh, we got the other you know, the checkmate stuff after this. Yeah, I mean, I suppose to be fair, like this was always billed from issue one as having Naomi on the book. So, I mean, I guess I could argue that this is just what Bendis' Justice League is going to be. I don't know if she sticks around or not, but I mean, she was always there on the covers th th and stuff. That, that's like a weird no-win scenario in that if she does stick around, it's kind of annoying because like she doesn't really deserve a place on the Justice League yet. Let's be honest. And uh, two, if she is gone, which you know, yes, yes, you're right, she was billed as uh, you know there from the start. But if she is gone, that still defaults the third arc to being the 
quote unquote regular Justice League and makes this still a weird one, even even if it was advertised as such. We'll, we'll see what he somehow ties into this. Maybe he'll they'll announce a new book with Bendis and then that'll tie into the third arc. Uh, well, I mean, there's months left yet, so could on. well be. Yeah, plenty of time for that to that to come. Uh, all right, main story uh, ratings, Matt. I'm gonna give it an eight. Matt, never change. <laughs> I never, never will. Because just because I have those complaints doesn't mean I didn't enjoy it. It's just it a sound like you're enjoying it. Uh, and again, rating things is dumb. Oh dear, Car. Uh, like a five. Mm. This is really funny, but I actually agree with the Matt, and I'll also give it an 8 out of 10. Um, which makes that entire debate kind of funny in hindsight. Uh, <laughs> Alright, you two might talk about Justice League Dark, because I didn't read it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, so for, for all the stuff that we, we just talked about, people joining up, we get a fun scene of them discussing if maybe Etrigan being around's a good idea. And he's yeah. sitting in the Justice League headquarters, you know, talking about how when Diana started the Justice League Dark, it was to foil threats like the demon, not team up with them. But Merlin's the bigger threat, so, you know. It's uh, great, because it's this, like, 15-panel page. Mm-hmm. Uh, three rows of, like, narrow uh, five panels. And it's just uh, mostly close-ups of the faces. Uh, you got, you know, mm-hmm. Superman, Batman, Aquaman, Flash... Canary, Hawk Girl, and, and Green Arrow. So the, the full league are represented on this page, and it's all their faces. And just every so often, I think it's like once per row, or maybe twice in the middle, you've just got Etrigan's hand just tapping on the table, like his fingers just yep. tapping. And it's it's got this great rhythm to it of this, it, you know, tap, lit- tap, a, a literal round table meeting, which mm-hmm. is very appropriate when we're talking about Merlin. And, uh, and, being hey, right. and hey, sometimes Etrigan can be a lot. So should he join Justice League Dark? I think not. You may continue. Yes. That's strangely on topic for you to interject with, actually. Yeah. Look, um, you, you brought up the question at the start. I, I, I had that, for the first sentence Matt said, I had that in my head, oh, I want to do a rhyme. I'm going to do a rhyme. I'm going to do an Etrigan rhyme. As you should you with Etrigan. the next two minutes it's... thinking of it. Because, <laughs> Connor, what's, what's the rule with Etrigan? He only rhymes on his last paragraph? I think uh, the way... Ram B's been writing Etrigan. Mm-hmm. It's been kind of every other sentence. Okay. It's been a rhyme, so it's like on the two and the four, essentially. Right. Um, because but, I mean, it his changes from first... writer to writer. Yeah, well, because his first here, there, I, I can't see a rhyme unless I'm reading it wrong. Uh... Um, because then he rhymes the last bubble on that, that big layout where they're at the round table. Um, yeah, it's with Helen first... well. Uh, right. Yeah. It's it's a little so. bit inconsistent with where the rhymes are, but they tend right. to be uh, once or twice per speech that he's giving. Right. Uh, different rhymes have different rules. Some have it as it's a compulsion, he has to rhyme no matter what. Others right. have it as it's a thing in hell that the more powerful right. deep rhyme, so he forces himself to rhyme, especially when he's in he wants to be he wants to appear right. more powerful. Right. So, but, uh, yeah. But yeah, but so they're, they're all talking about, you know, if he's there... You know, it must be serious. And Constantine just kind of in the back, enjoying the kind of the chaos. Of yeah, because you've got basically a Batman going, well, Zatanna, you should probably re- lead the Justice League Dark now because Wonder Woman's gone yeah. and you're a worthy successor. You you know, you dealt with the Upside Down Man. And she's very modest about it. So everyone on the team did it. Uh, but, you know, she found the fatal flaw, as, as Batman puts it. Uh, and, you know, Superman's in support of this. And then it gets to you know, talk about Merlin, and Ollie cracks some jokes. Oh well, my Merlin's way more dangerous. Yeah, and, and, and Constantine's having none of it. Uh, yep. Yeah. You know, this isn't well, just some magician. This is the magician, and he also calls uh, Ollie Squire. Ah, uh, Squire. Yeah. You know, which which I do like. Um, and then we get uh, Merlin coming into a bookshop, um, which I. I feel we saw this bookshop in the future state stuff. Um, oh, I mean, I can't say for sure we didn't. Yeah. But, but the, the page by page bookshop just kind of rings a bell, and Merlin walks in in all his glory, looking like he's wearing a, a, a fur cape 
I kind of deal. Raven feathers. Yeah. Um, to to pull this book from this bookshop owner, uh, who who is Mr. Lieberman, um, which he he's like, well, no, I I don't want to buy the book. I want to set them free, and it looks like he does some powerful magic that starts bringing like monsters and creatures out of the pages of the book, which is a really great visual. Yeah, and it's like these original manuscripts of mm -hmm. uh, Jorge Luis Borges, uh, mm -hmm. his his short stories. Um, so again, yeah, we've we've talked before how Ramby loves to play with the idea of storytelling, right. and its effects. Uh, this seems to be an extension of that where it's it's stories coming to life, mm -hmm. and how they will impact the world. Uh, which I'm super interested to see what he does with these because it is just a tease right now. You know that it's. They're coming out of the books as all different things, but we don't get anything more from them of like what it's going to do. No, um, not from beyond... here because, um, I mean, we, we eventually see what what happens there, but that's not till the final pages. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah, you uh, we, we get like again, it's just a little bit more of the uh, with the Justice League, Batman and Electric and squaring off, but mm -hmm. the, the the real. Big bit at the end of this is, uh, you know, we you know we have uh, an employee visits the the bookshop where all this was going mm -hmm. down. Who uh, I'm going to leave unnamed for a moment because I'm sure right. most of our viewers would recognize his name as as I'm sure you did, Matt, when, when you were reading yeah. it. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, um, but he's he walks in and you know there's like these vines coming out of the storeroom and it's like very unnatural. There's floating books, and he goes in and. His boss is lying dead on the floor, being eaten by what can only be described as vulture men. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like uh, very uh, kind of kind of reminiscent of the Tengu from the Power Rangers movie, almost. Like yeah, the kind of the bird men. Um, yeah, yeah, kind of very very vulture headed. Yeah. Uh, and they're eating on his his dead body. Um, but then he uh. He starts whipping out his abilities because this is, of course, uh, Ragman. Mm -hmm. He's like, "Come on, we got you know, uh, more, more souls to get," uh, and and that's the final page. Him, you know, in costume, this big full page splash of him, you know, attacking these these vultures. Um, pretty cool. Uh, excited to yep. see what he does with this. Definitely, um, Zamanico's art too. It's you, know, you brought it up earlier with the layouts and stuff, but just. He fits really, really well with uh, this kind of magic-y stuff, uh, which I, I did like his, his stuff in Wonder Woman a whole lot. And his Justice League stuff was good, too. But here, it really pops. Um, yeah, I think that first page is probably the, my favorite page from him, mm -hmm. uh, where it is just all the, the face close-ups and, yeah. and the hand, just the pacing of it. You know, they're just everyone just looking around at each other. Because you, you do yeah. get this sense of, uh, especially if you look at like Superman, he's a recurring uh, character yeah. on the page, looking from side to side. Even one page, where, you know, a one panel where yeah. he's still looking dead ahead like he is in the first one, mm -hmm. but just his eyes are shifted off to one side. So right. you can see, oh, he's looking at the, well, in, in this case, Kendra, who spoke last, who's to the panel to the left of him. And it's a right. really good effect. Well, and then you got Batman who doesn't say anything, and it's the same scowl the entire time. Yeah. It's just this you know, repeated, just uh, he's just there thinking the entire time. It's great. Yep. You know, so that, that's pretty good. And yeah, it does. A, now that you pointed out, it does a really good job at the geography of the room just by Superman looking around. Because when it's revealed where everybody's standing, it still lines up. So that's yeah. some that's some fantastic storytelling. But no, I, I really enjoy this. I wish I wish this this part of the story was longer and I would pay more. Like if it was a half and half. Because I I'm really enjoying. His yeah, Justice League like, I, I think it's it's well paced for ten pages. Like yeah. it it feels like it's still. Uh, we got two mm -hmm. complete sections in this. We got yeah. the Zatanna kind of stepping up and leading the Justice League Dark and the debate around that stuff, and yeah. we got the advancement with Merlin re releasing the stories and the Ragman reveal. So there is actually mm -hmm. quite a lot in here. It's just uh, not enough. Basically, you just mm -hmm. want more. Cause it's so good. Um, but it's paced for the format, which is the most important thing. It doesn't feel like I'm just getting... This This doesn't feel like it was cut in half with the last one, and this should have been one long issue in any way, because right. they're completely unrelated uh, in, in everything. But, you know, aside from the ongoing things, there isn't, like, 
it doesn't feel like it was one issue cut into, which is the most important thing. Mm-hmm. Um, no, it's really good. Yeah. Uh, it's like an 8.5 from me, this this back half. Yeah, I'm going to give it an 8.5 as well. All right, cool. Uh, the Flash, 769. Jeremy Adams writing with David Lafayette and Brandon Peterson on the R. Um, so, who came back for a sh- uh, this? Well, it's not issue two, but the second issue. Not, not I. Not you? Not I, I did. I did. I regret it because uh, it's basically just knock off River Song from Doctor. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She she is knock off River Song. I, I had to. Well, I actually quite like this character, so uh, I'm going to upset Connor and say she's better than River Song. And uh, Matt's going to love her because she's a combination of Booster Gold and Blue Beetle. Uh, yeah, she's uh, she showed <laughs> up in. Another story I remember reading. I can't remember where, but she's Gold Beetle, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, indeed. Oh. Um, um, I thought this was all right to be honest. I didn't have any huh? too harsh to say about how, it. So, how, how do the Dominators play into it based off the cover? Uh, not a huge deal. There's like a one giant okay. Dominator that got in. Inf- it's in the same way that the uh, the Raptor got Speed Force powers uh, in the last issue. Uh, mm-hmm. Basically, when Wally went into Bart's body in this. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the the discharge or something like create the anomaly of the of the gi- this giant kaiju sized dominator speed force bro speed force bro you can right. go explain shit yeah pretty much uh but most of the issue other than the the stuff that cuts back to you know barry and terrific and ollie having to go put like a time capsule in the uh like this flash museum so that bart or wally and bart's body can like retrieve something later uh, because basically they, they realize that Barry gets a little bit of his powers back and the idea is that Wally, as he's plugging these holes in the speed force in the timeline, uh, is fixing the speed force. So that's what we're doing for a bit. Mm-hmm. But it does have the caveat that Wally's body disappeared when he started doing this. So they don't know where his body is. So where is he going to go when everything's fixed? Like, what's going to happen? So that's kind of setting up a little mission for them to deal with. Uh, but most of the issue is Wally with... Uh, this this was uh, blue gold gold blue what, what was it? Uh, gold beetle. Gold beetle. There you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, so she she's got the you know the the, the ship kind of like blue beetle does. That's a little bit different, but very quickly she hears the communications between Wally and the pe- you know the characters in the present, and it turns out that she has met Wally already before, and there's a lot of jokes and references to stuff that's going to happen soon, but she can't really tell him about that yet. Uh, I as, did... as as River Song would say, spoilers. Stop referencing a crap show, all right? Uh, River Song has a very large fan base. Well, la dee da. But uh, here, there's jokes here about how she's apparently got the hots for uh, uh, Wally's son in the future when when he's grown up, uh, and little things like that. Uh, for, I thought... for, for Jay. For Jay, yeah. When Jay's uh, yeah, okay. grown up, because because she's like, hey, is he still single? And he's like. He's eight. It's like, not when I meet him. Yeah. Grr. <laughs> like, <okay. laughs> um, so there's a lot of fun stuff there. Um, I, I kind of dug the chemistry between them. I thought this issue didn't dwell on the bad stuff from the previous issue that much. And in fact, if anything, the hints where, you know, Wally sort of implies that he was about to retire as Flash and, you know, Gold Beetle basically sort of chuckles and goes, yeah, right, you've got like five crises to go through before you're done. Um, it was kind of like an affirmation that, yeah, don't be ridiculous. Wally's not done. Like, if it, this was like one of the first signs in the book where it was like, no, 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 Wally's future is still very much as Wally. Uh, and it felt like it wasn't dwelling in the, the dark or like, oh, I have to get over my Heroes in Crisis shtick. Um, it kind of said, no, we're just having fun with this uh, for better or worse. Uh, and I had fun with most of this issue. Um, it wasn't necessarily like amazing storytelling or anything, but it was solid enough and. I had fun with the characters bouncing off of each other. Uh, obviously, there's a cliffhanger at the end as to where he jumps to next, which we'll I'll get into. But um, I had a lot of fun with most of this, to be honest. And I think it benefited because it was a regular size. Because if you remember, last issue was extended and it was like a forty-page uh, issue. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this benefited greatly from just being the twenty pages, and it had a nice pacing to it. And I had fun with the uh, the antics, and even just uh. uh you know, like, oh, how are we going to break into the Flash Museum? Oh, the same way Bart usually does, just being impulsive, and it's a full-page spread of her crashing the ship into the, the top of the building. It's, like, so ungraceful. Uh, I thought that was funny. So, I, I was not a big fan of the art in this issue. 
mm. uh, either artists um in the future stuff with uh with wally i didn't uh, was the faces in particular i didn't like there's a lot of faces that just looked off and kind of completely took me out of the moment mm-hmm. um I will say the I think the future stuff I kind of like because it felt like it was very expressive and kind of over the top cartoony, but I think it fit kind of the personality of the two characters. I, I agree with the the present day stuff though, because I mean I had the same complaints last issue about some of that being a bit a bit off. Yeah, it, it, it has that cut and paste feel, like the characters aren't in mm. their environment; they're just stuck on. Uh, I, I think maybe the future stuff's a bit more down to taste than it is. Uh... Yeah, I think it's objective. just I don't like some of the yeah. facial expressions the way they're done. It, it doesn't work for me. I, uh, I, I actually quite like the art in the future stuff, and luckily that is, I'd say, the majority of the issue. It is, uh, yeah. So uh, I, I came out feeling a bit more positive on that. But I, I really like Gold Beetle. I was like down for, for more of her uh, going forward. Uh, and the fact that she like hugs Wally goodbye, and then like he leaves you know Bart's body, and then Bart's like there, he's like, hey, what the hell are you doing, Gold Beetle? And she's like, quiet, I'm having a moment. And she just keeps hugging him. <laughs> uh, it's just really sweet. And when he jumps at the end to wherever he's going next, uh, we're in the golden age, and it looks like he's in Jay's body, uh, and Hitler's there with the spear of destiny. <laughs> oh. oh, boy. Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I think this this issue... I mean, I enjoyed a lot of the first one, even though there was definitely things I didn't like. This one, I think, sold me more on this arc, which I was very cynical about going into at, at the start. Um, I think this one though, I was like, you know what? I'm actually kind of into this adventure for what it is, and I think it, it leaving the oh miserable Wally has to get over the stuff he went through stuff, and just being like, no, you've got a future. Like you're totally going to be a Flash, and you're totally going to still be a hero. Like don't even don't even kid yourself. Like that's what you are. It felt like it was sending it in the right direction. So I wouldn't say it's like an amazing issue or anything, but I think I I I read this last expecting it to be the sort of, oh, it'll be okay, or whatever. And I kind of came out thinking, oh, you know what, I had fun with that. That was good, it was good. I, maybe my expectations are just in a really shitty place with Flash right now, but I I felt <laughs> quite good about it. I got it over and done with first, because, uh, you know, I, I, it was like, all right, I'll get started earlier in the week, you know, I'm in bed, I was like, I'll read one of my comics, and then I'm, I'm looking at my list, it's like, well, I'm a little bit as tired, and there's a, there's, a, there's a reasonable chance I could fall asleep reading this, so I'm not going to read Night. I'm going to read Catwoman. <laughs> I'm obligated to pay attention to Justice League. So I guess I'm going to read Flash. <laughs> uh, so that's why it ended up being the first one I read. Um, it's, it's, I think it's probably better than the first issue. I think I think it being shorter really does help. I don't know if that's just because it's actually paced better or if there's less time for me to dwell on the stuff that I don't like. It's just all right, it's over. I'm not actually sure. <laughs> but I definitely preferred it over the last issue. Um, but it has its own different problems for me. Like I say, I, I couldn't read uh, their relationship without just feeling like it was knockoff Doctor Who and not as good, frankly. Uh, which was a, it was a real, really distracting. I, I, I never it even... It all I could think of. I never thought of Doctor Who once, and I've seen all those episodes, which is amusing to me. Uh, but Pete, it's been a sour you don't remember things, so it's fine. That's true. I don't remember that, to be fair. It's just, it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that good. Right. <laughs> you take that back. It wasn't that good. I I only recognize the name from Doctor Who fans. That's all. I have zero idea what her character is, but I knew that when Connor said it, Pete was gonna say something. <laughs> so that's why I laughed. What well, once once Tennant left, uh, you know not worth bothering with. Um well, that's just fundamentally not true. Connor, who's your favorite doctor? I mean, it probably is Tenant. <laughs> that doesn't mean the other stuff's Game, not worth Game, set, no, just, and match. Because <laughs> usually, what well, I'm saying, because usually people that say that are big Matt Smith, you know. I I, 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 I love them yeah. for very different reasons, because Matt Smith's stuff is, it's it's a fairy tale story, essentially. Right. Uh, you know, the overall kind of themes and, and tone is this fairy tale yeah. stuff, and, and that's great, and I love that stuff. Uh, not all of it, some, some bad episodes in there as well, am I wrong. But overall, just, big fan. Just to uh, sum up the uh, the thoughts on the Flash. issue is that uh, I I think I had a slight worry as I was reading it because I was enjoying it. I was like half pace. I was like, you know, I'm kind of enjoying this relationship and I'm liking this character and I'm liking the the bouncing off with Wally. Um, I was like, yeah, but you know, like it'll be a different period, different characters next next issue. 
And I think as I read it, I felt really confident about it, because, hey, okay, you've got this, like, through line of the characters in the present trying to help him, and their chemistry's solid enough for what it's doing. Um, but that sort of grounds it. But then when it got to the cliffhanger at the end, and I'm like, oh, wait, I actually kind of, I'm into, like, Indiana Jones era, Jay Garrick, like, adventure for the next one. I don't know, I've not looked ahead to the solicitors to see what the, the, fu- the future issues are going to be around, but if they continued in the line of known speedsters, then... You know, I don't see why this should be fun. I'm kind of interested in having a glance in the July solicits just to see what the the next arc is. Because we didn't actually look, right? You know, we just... It was there. But I was like, what's it actually doing now? Uh, says, you know, reunite with his wife. Basically, he's getting back into being Flash, it seems still, uh, in, in the next arc. We're good. Well, I mean, this is the story of him realizing presumably he still wants to be Flash and doesn't want to retire, so next arc will be him settling back into actually being the Flash, presumably. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I really liked Gold Beetle. She's a new a new uh, minor favorite. <laughs> so apparently she's only been around since Future State, and I'm confusing her with another character that's kind of similar. Mm. But uh, I guess that's good. That she made that much of an indent that what, or an impression. Was she in Future State? She was in the Future State Suicide Squad books. I, I ah. pulled her up to see where else I would know her from, but I think she's just similar to another Booster Blue Beetle mashup character. Oh, um, we should mention that her her version of Skeets is called Beats, and it's shaped like a beetle. I should, I suppose we should mention that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like uh, Matt would be upset cool. if we didn't answer that. That's, yeah. that's true. Yeah. Yes. But it's spelled not like the <laughs> headphones, but it's like the B double E T S. Yeah. Right. Gotcha. So, so. Okay, I, I I think my favorite stuff of that first Flash issue was the the Jurassic Park adventure dinosaur stuff. Once it because of the first chunk of it is where it kind of faltered because it was dealing with all the crap that it had to be mm. well dealt with, I guess. Um. So now this actually got to just be the adventure side, and it was fun again. I'm feeling borderline confident that I will equally enjoy the next issue. Not that it will be an amazing issue, but you know, I still went into this one with a ah, but maybe it won't be that good, or you know, it's, it's definitely the lesser, and it still is the lesser of the books that came out this week. Don't get me wrong, but uh, I'm like, hey, you know what? Solid seven. I had fun. Connor, were you in it? <laughs> Give it a six. It's fine. There you go. There you go. I'm reading the next one. I'm a, yeah, I half expected to be dropping this after an issue or two. And I'm, yeah, well, yeah, I'm in. I'm in. Uh, so cool. Nightwing issue 79. Tom Taylor writing with Bruno Redondo on the art. Um, AKA one of our favorite books right now. Um, so... We have the fallout of Nightwing receiving all of Alfred's money from Mm -hmm. uh, his fortune, and what he wants to do with that money is kind of one of the key focuses of of this issue, as well as, of course, setting up this uh, new heart-stealing villain that uh, has been introduced here. So, Tom Taylor, would you believe it? He's very good at introducing some characters just to be killed off, but making me care about it a little bit. Uh, Yeah. So, what... What I like about this one is it does feel almost like a continuation of Suicide Squad in tone, right? Mm-hmm. To where there was a very much of, of a point about wanting to do better and do more. And I love that Dick Grayson picked up that baton, you know, here. I'd maybe even go beyond tone and say theme as well. Yeah, maybe mm-hmm. theme, not just tone. But yeah, that he sees people struggling and he's like, well, I'm going to help him every way I can, not just as Nightwing, but as Dick Grayson. And I love, I love that. And especially from, well, well, I'm sure we'll get there, but the conversation him and Babs have about him having basically to remember who he is and almost, you know, like he takes this advantage, he takes advantage of that to become a new version of himself. Like, you know, so just the meta storytelling and what he decides to do here with the money, I think is, you know, yeah, I, I kind of. It's really I, nice. After a couple of pages of just sort of, hey, this is my history kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I love that it just kind of flows on naturally from the events of the last issue, where it's the same night, and he's like, oh, I'm really hungry because I'm eyeing up this uh, dog food. 
<laughs> so yeah, they kill both. Yeah, so then let's go get some pizza. Uh, and I actually, I'll, I'm not gonna lie, I don't know why this is as funny as it is, but him going up to the pizza place that just gives out the slices and saying, "Hey, mm-hmm. two slices, please." And then Bob's going, "Hey, you're a, you're a billionaire now." It's like, "Oh yeah, give me four slices." Yeah, and also one of my two only art quibbles in this issue is in this panel. Mm-hmm. And these are like probably my biggest complaints with the entire book. Is this, an art, is, it, hold on, hold on. is this an art problem or a philosophical problem of how he holds up four fingers? Because this one's that. The other one is. Uh, well, I mean, I guess it falls into it, but it's it's an art choice. Sure. Who holds up those four fingers? Like maybe if you're counting upwards first, sure. But who goes four fingers and does that and not that? And, and for the audio listeners, I put my thumb down for the second one as opposed. Because if we go to... like this, you're bringing up the four horsemen. Okay, okay. Just, yeah, just to establish for people who aren't looking at us in the comic, he, he's got all the fingers but the pinky up. That's right. how he's holding up four fingers. I, I can't do. My fingers are weird, so I just, or do the horseman. It's a little bit weird. It's a little bit weird to yeah. do. Yeah, I mean, this would have got him shot in Inglorious Bastards, wouldn't it? Or wouldn't have got him shot. One of the yeah. Well, I can't remember which way around it I was. I can't but remember right. which one, yeah. but. That's held up the wrong I, I, combination. The difference between being shot and not shot is, is a really big difference. Yeah, 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 yeah. you know what I mean. Is he like, used the wrong one. And, yeah. You know, the, the yeah. bad guys paying attention picked up on it and knew he wasn't who he said he was, blah, blah, blah. Here, there's not the... It's pizza. It's not life and death. death thing, it's, just, but... it's just... It's like, if that's your <laughs> your instinct to do it, because like, he's yeah. already got the two fingers up, you know, mm-hmm. it is uh, his first two. You can see that above it. Yeah. So then, I hate to say this. Those, Connor's right. Too. Rather than those two, but yeah, again, I mean, I'm swapping, swapping between them for the audio listeners. It's just, just weird. That said, I will, I will stick up for a. I've never done this before, but I will often do this for three. Yeah, yeah, no, three's fine because you count upwards. You, you tend to start from your thumb and go up. Yeah. Right? Three, so yeah. when you get to three, that's fine, and that's why if Maybe. you're counting up to four and you go up that way, it's you can kind of start and get to that, like the the pose he has there. It's if, but if you go going from Maybe? nothing to four. You ever think that Redondo just wants to show people he can draw hands? <laughs> it's possible. He's he's the anti. Uh, I, I like the idea, I like the idea that Connor can bring this complaint to Redondo on Twitter, and Redondo will just redraw the panel with one finger like this. Yeah, <laughs> just for Connor. <laughs> that, would be, that would be well deserved. <laughs> what was the other uh, complaint? You said you had two. I I do, and it's. It's actually, well, it's a two-part complaint, but it's to do with the way they hold pizza. Like, underneath, he, he's <laughs> yeah. eating the slice, he's holding it on the top, like, with his like fingers all the way across. The, yeah. Okay, and then sure. on the next page, when he sat on the bench, he sat, like, with it just, you know, he's holding it by the crust this time, which is a right. good start, but it's just flopping down. Like, what, what, what is he doing? <laughs> this mean... man does not know how to eat pizza. Uh, that, this is... Have you seen his abs? Of course he doesn't know how to eat pizza. This is technically all very true. Yeah. I, I, I can't say I care, but... No, I did not even notice it until he pointed well, it out. I, I so. want to make it very clear, none of this matters. None of no. this is is getting any negative points when it comes to the end. Yeah. This is having no impact on anything. Can, but can I, I noticed it, it and I want to talk about it. I, I do love the name of the pizza place, is Marvin George's, because, you know... And he does this a little bit later, but when they just start dropping creator names as like street names, mm-hmm. I just I appreciate that this is you know sounds a little bit know. more subtle than most. Yeah, even though you look uh, across it on that same panel, and it has Nightwing created by Marv Wolfman and George Perez. You know, I think it's because it's the typically they use the surnames, and it's like I say, it's street names or right. like, oh, it's something. Well, because we get a plaza. yeah, because we get a Wen Bridge uh, later. In this yeah. same issue, and that's so, uh, it being the first names makes it a little bit less common yeah. and makes it and less. And the guy at the shop looks like George Perez, which is yeah. nice. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah, so oh. they're eating the pizza in the park, and a man and his son who are either homeless or at the very least, you know, poor. Uh, up. Yeah, they they ask, "Hey, do you have any change you could spare us?" and but I was like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't really carry cash. And this actually felt very relatable, because, like, who does now, yeah. really? Like, <laughs> we're at a point in time where this doesn't happen. And Dick has a moment, he's like, wait a minute, how about you come, go, go to the pizza place, I'll buy you some pizza, bring any, fr- any friends you've got who need to eat. Everyone. Yeah, yeah. bring them, because, hey, I, I, he can afford it. So he starts just feeding pizza to everyone, and the guy at the pizza place is just delightful. Uh, 
Dan Didio there looks happy and delighted because he's just he's just selling tons of pizza. And they were going out of business as well. Like there's a sign on the on the door. Yeah. That's why they're they're offering the two for one slices, I assume. Yeah. Yeah. Uh and it doesn't mention this in the art, but I I've got a feeling that Dick probably said to him, Look, by the way, take out the two for one sign, I'll pay for them all full. Yeah. <laughs> I'll pay for them in full. For, for sure. Well, I'd passed him, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. just to confirm um, that those guys, you know, you know, the, the main two were homeless because he's he's offers to, to book them a room at a, a of hotel. course yeah of course yeah, uh, the three seasons which of course in bloodhaven even the fourth season is missing yeah <laughs> <laughs> there would be too much class for bloodhaven um, yeah, yeah. Uh, which actually leads me to my bizarrely my f- oh my dropped my tablet uh bizarrely my favorite joke in the whole book which is so nightwing so deck gets pickpocketed and instead of like you know that's been like a serious thing it's more just funny that nightwing got pickpocketed and he's like, don't tell anyone this. And he's, Babs is like, too late. I already put it on the group chat. And for some reason, I mean, that's funny in itself. But the and oh, even just the fact that his phone keeps dinging as he's walking away and annoyed that he get pickpocketed. But the thing I love here, there's something about Cass, the one who doesn't talk, being like abusive with emojis is yeah. really funny to me. Well, it makes sense as well. Yeah, because to me, she doesn't think in words. She thinks in expressions. Yes. So, so, of course, she uses the... And then just the ding, 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 ding. Like, yeah. Yeah. The fact that it's also a white background for this panel. Yeah. So, it's just the dinging. There's no, like, surrounding. It's like, all he can... All he can like, it's not... It's like, he's so... All he's thinking about is the phone going off. He's not thinking about the surroundings yeah. or anything. So, that's why you've got the white background. It's just this perfect right. art and, adding and to the story. His, his body language, too. You know? I just... It, it's really good stuff. Yeah. Um... Just here. And also the use of the dots in some of these other pages instead of heavy shadows. So I just had to look at what those are called. So on the page where the, the guy and his son ask for, you know, the spare change, um, instead of just being in, in silhouette oh, or shadow, the pop, art. the pop art. So apparently they're called Ben Day dots, which I never knew until I wanted to use the proper term. Yeah, um, I've always just referred to them as pop art dots because yeah. typically people know what that means uh, yeah. if you describe them as that. But mm. I don't remember Redondo using these as much in Suicide Squad. So if this is just him experimenting using it Nightwing, I'm I, I like it a lot. I think it's interesting because it, you see a lot of artists use them as backgrounds, and that yeah. is one of the examples here. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's you know when he actually has but, the idea, but also on that same page above mm-hmm. it, uh, it has uh, Dick and Babs themselves right. like shaded uh, in the dots as opposed mm-hmm. to just being. So soft. I wonder if that's you. <sighs> Well, he's just listed as the artist, so it's not even the the um, inker. So it's just him. So yeah, yeah it's him and uh, Adriana Lucas on colors. Uh, yes. Um, um, if nothing else, it's just a tool to uh, differentiate something. Uh, right, and and I like that because too, and then you know, and then the scene where him and Dabs go back to his apartment when he's tracking his wallet. Uh, even the shadows are, are they got the dots on them that go through him. So it's just, I do think it it adds almost to this that. I just want to say pop art, but it adds it to oh. a flair of how different Bloodhaven is and how different Dick is now. There's a really subtle use to it on the next page. So the next page is where the uh, the homeless man is like essentially mugged, seemingly. But then it's, yeah. you know we get the darker ending to it later, yeah. uh, where he tells his son to go back, and there's a guy with some sort of fancy looking gun pointed yeah. at him. But there's one panel where the, the the dots are used just on where the shadows would be or the shading would be on his like his nose and his eyelids. Yeah. And it's just a little bit of it, and that's all it is in the whole panel. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but... I think they're on the the hand with the gun as well on the next couple of panels. Oh, yeah. they are. I didn't even notice because it was so dark. But yeah, you're right. Yeah. They are there. Yeah. So it's, it's it's there kind of repeatedly throughout, like uh, on the next page when we see the the full reveal of this guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, the mask is has a really interesting effect actually, um, because it's like a, a full face thing. You don't get a mm-hmm. good look at them, but it's got like a a reflective quality to it, I want to say. It it reminds me of the bad guy from um, Brian Hill's Outsiders. I forget his name, uh, but he wore the, the oh, silver mask. Mr. Uh, Not Mr. Nobody, that was a detective. No, yeah. Um, but you know who I'm talking about. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it reminds me of that guy. Um, and I know it's not him, but um, it's, it's that, yeah, that sheen almost. Of, yeah. of the mask. So, so that's, I mean, I, I call it a gun because that's, you know, it's got a gun like shape, but it's actually mm-hmm. more of like a, like a retractable arm thing that comes out and goes mm-hmm. into the guy's chest. And 
basically this guy pulls out his heart. He pulls out his heart. Yeah, yeah there's a hole in his chest. And we, we come back to it at the end of the the book uh, just to head it home. But uh, Dick's gonna he's putting his outfit on. He's gonna go after these you know these muggers, these pickpocketers, and. You know, Babs explains that she's not not going with them. She's going to stay behind, and she's got new tech in her back. And you know, she can do normal things, but maybe it's it's pushing it. You know, jumping from rooftops. Mm-hmm. Uh, so she goes out. He's, he's she's in her ear, his ear. Sorry, uh, and she puts everything on his his visor so she can see yeah. through his eyes, basically a little yeah. camera. Yeah, a little mechanical thing just so to explain yeah. why she can see stuff. Uh, and basically, these pickpockers end up pickpocketing Maroni, Salvatore Maroni. Yeah. Uh, and there's a little bit of the, the plot thread here where uh, uh, the Zuko, what's her name? Uh, Melinda. Z- Melinda Zuko. You know, because we know that she's maybe getting in line to be mayor because of what happened with Blockbuster yeah. last issue. So that you're reminded of that in this issue without it ever being like a bigger plot point. It's just kind of there to right. keep, keep it in your head so that you know it for next issue. So it's still kind of bubbling away. Yeah. Uh, I, I like the way that Maroney says it where she goes, I'm not mayor yet. And he's like, really? Do you think your predecessor's head is going to be uncrushed? <laughs> And it was just a, you know, a throwaway almost. I would say the, uh, possibly the most pointless editor's note I've ever seen. Yes. Mm. But I see last issue, it's like, yeah, that was pretty memorable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, Nightwing is basically saying, oh, come on, kids, don't try and pickpocket these guys. You don't know who you're pickpocketing. Mm-hmm. But of course they do. The, the, you know, the henchmen notice and go chase. We get this gorgeous two-page spread of uh, all the sequence of like Dick jumping down from the top of the building. We see all the all the, the, the motion and the the steps of him jumping down. Uh again, kind of like a sort a, a muted colour. Uh and it does kind of have the dots, doesn't it? It does, yeah. 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 Uh, it does. Uh and it's only the very, very last one at the end where he sort of trips the last henchman that he's actually in full colour. Uh still with the dots though, but Yeah, super yeah. super cool stuff. It's it's something we see a lot in Night- I think Nightwing and Daredevil as well, who's a very comparable character. Yeah, I was going to say, it's very, it yeah. reminds me a lot of Daredevil, and I don't know if it's because of the stick, you know? like I think it's just because Nightwing and Daredevil, their action style is very similar yeah. in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 100%. You, you either tend to see this version where it's the colors blocked out, or they'll do full color, but it'll be like have like a, a translucent effect. Yeah. So you can like see through them a little bit, so you can kind of get this effect of it, it being in the past. We don't usually see it, though, with this many iterations in the movement. No. Like, it's usually just like two or three over a jump, whereas this is the entire sequence. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, you, yeah. Can, you can follow it, right? Like, oh, yeah. It's almost sure. like an animation. I think one of my favorite points of this is uh, in the bottom left corner of this page, as he gets down off the building, yeah. uh, he swings on like a line uh, before he lands on a bus. Mm-hmm. Um but you can see that he's done a flip in midair. Even though we don't see that, we just see the landing right. um, because of just the, the way the lines are drawn to show yeah. like the the trajectory of the movement. You can see the flip, even though it's not there. I think that's really clever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that no, was a good sense of motion to the whole thing. And so he quickly takes the guards. He chases the kids and finds essentially a homeless camp of all these like children, and then you know feels like shit and like you know doesn't care about his wallet anymore. Which he actually acknowledges beforehand that. All he really has in his wallet, other than like you know, twenty dollars, is like just like receipts and old crap that he doesn't really need. Yeah. Uh, what is uh, credit cards? His business cards it? they'll never look at, and a fine collection yeah. of old receipts. Like, I mean, the credit it's... cards are not having to cancel a card is annoying. Like that's the the most annoying. Sure, part. no, it yeah. is. What does she say? She calls it like his collection of something. Nothing, maybe. Like your, your, <laughs> your, no, your, your, your pocket trash collection. Pocket trash. Your pocket trash collection. There you go. That made me give an actual laugh. As I'm reading this in bed this morning. And it's this experience uh, with, you know, obviously between the homeless people before that he was helping feed and then these kids at this this camp, yeah. that it makes him realize what he wants to do with the money. He wants to be a safety net for the city. That's how he phrases it. Uh, he wants to be there to support everyone who falls, uh, which is so Dick Grayson. But, you know, again, that, that metaphor was Dick, Dick Grayson's origin story. What did he do yeah. in the circus? Yeah. You know, so it just is perfect. And uh, just at the final page, as he says that, uh, we see just that, you know, it brings us back to the, the homeless man with the hole in his chest, uh, with this villain standing over him, whoever he may be. Uh, so, yeah, really great stuff. Just, I, and, and I know it's a little bit too much, right? And I'm sure he wanted to be more nuanced, but the fact that Dick has so much heart in this issue, like, you can <laughs> just, the way that, the way that he, that Redondo draws him when he comes across the homeless camp, right? We just see him from behind, but just his body language, you can tell the state of shock 
right? Like, he was surprised this is where he was going to end up. And then just the way that he kind of walks away almost in shame, you know, like, that you could tell this really affected him emotionally. Um, and so for the next part to be called Heartless, like, you've just built up, show us how much heart Dick Grayson has. Like, that's that's some really good storytelling. <laughs> yeah, it's impressive stuff. You, you've got, like, the build-up of this villain. You've got building sympathy with this, this character who gets his heart taken. Uh, it makes it feel like... The, the issue essentially builds the idea of all these people that the city's failed because the city you know it co there's constant references in this this issue about how the city's not looking after people and mm -hmm. it builds the idea of all these homeless people as being representative of who this city's failed and fallen through the cracks so to have one of them be attacked it kind of feels like something's attacking everyone at the bottom end of the city so nightwing's saying he wants to fight for these people and he's just it doesn't even mean it in this way literally he means it through money he means it through all these other methods but by giving us a villain who's attacking that part of the city, it paints everything in the issue. To, it pulls it all together into one neat thematic thread that mm -hmm. makes it feel cohesive as a story. It's really good storytelling, and mm -hmm. to the point where, like, yeah, like everything comes together yeah. in a way that just works. Yeah, and and the way that the Bloodhaven started as a whaling town, and so that statue him and Babs go look at is a you know like a whaler fighting a kraken. And that it was a reminder that this town could fight monsters. And the town has forgotten that because it's been overrun by monsters. And just what that means with the homeless kids, the guy that was asking, you know, for a spare change and what all this means, I just, it just goes together so well. Yeah. Um, it's an exceptional issue that is very wise with its time. It's funny in places it needs to be. It makes you love the heroes more. And it builds a proper villain. Uh, I mean, maybe not like who he is exactly yet, but at least the, the, the menace of him, the threat of this mysterious villain. Yeah. Uh, so it's funny. I probably still think the last issue was better, but only because it made me like tear up because it was so emotionally impactful. Yeah. But, I think part of it as well is it was a first issue back, you know, to yeah. Nightwing, and everyone was like, oh my God, you know, this, this return. Yeah. It had a bit more emotional weight just from us going into it beyond even what the issue did. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, but this is not that I'm necessarily going to give it a perfect score, but it's pretty f almost flawless in terms of what it's setting out to do. Uh, mm -hmm. So with that said, Matt, what are you rating Nightwing issue seven? Uh, I'm giving this one a nine point five. Connor, I'm, I'm going to give it a nine because I think like you say, it's it's more or less flawless. It just doesn't have the emotional punch that that mm -hmm. kind of lifts it above that. Yeah, I'm also give it a straight nine out of ten. Uh, mm -hmm. But I mean, Taylor's batting average here. Uh, but for two issues, he's had what two nines, two nine point fives, and two tens. You know, between the three of us across the two issues, that's the scores that have been given out. It's pretty good. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty good average, uh, and it only yeah. makes it feel more and more. Again, this is the start of a special run. As long as he gets enough time to really go on this, which mm -hmm. hopefully he does. And the fact that they're giving him a Superman book as well just kind of confirms that they, they probably they believe in Tom Taylor as they should. But barring sales tanking, which by all accounts they're above expectations. Well, Matt almost had to pay twenty dollars for for the issue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, I, I think yeah, we're probably in good hands for as long as Taylor wants to write the book. Which you know yes. he might have a finite story he wants to get in oh, and maybe. out, or he yeah. might have a, a longer story. I, I don't know. Yeah, he tends to vary uh, depending uh, on the book. I know what I'm hoping for. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Catwoman, issue 30. Ram V writing with Fernando Blanco on the art. Uh, and speaking of books that are doing everything really well right now uh, yeah. and firing all cylinders. I mean, the only the only problem this book has is that it's coming out in the same week as Nightwing. So it may be just... Yeah. It's slightly lesser by comparison, but that's really the only reason because it's, mm -hmm. it's doing it lots of great stuff. It's as good as every other issue of this, this run yeah. has been. Uh, yeah, this is great stuff here. It introduces a new mystery character uh, for a start. Mm -hmm. um, but we have Selina uh, dealing with Riddler. Riddler's like still alive. Oh, remember, he got shot at the end of the last mm -hmm. issue. Uh, yeah. And she kind of coerces some information out of him. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll put it that way. Squeezes the bullet hole. Yeah. Um, yeah. But ultimately, what wants to know what, what Ivy's connection to all this is. And he talks about the drug. And he says, you know, basically, this was not created or synthesized. It has a, has a source, 
and given Ivy disappearing, it wasn't too much to put it two and two together. And says, can we can we talk about the layout of the the Riddler yeah, stuff? The question here? mark. But sure. The yeah. question. It's, it's, it's like the page that it's when he's like doped up on the the, the drugs and the painkillers, <laughs> and you get like this page that's kind of from his perspective telling his story of what's happened. Mm-hmm. And I say it's all green and in the shape of a question mark, but it's at like an actual off angle. You have to actually tilt mm-hmm. to read it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, super unique and like it just really gives and, it this different feel. Yeah, and the the company that the the logo comes from is Icarus Life Sciences, right? So it's mm-hmm. maybe something that was above the board at one point. Uh, and now they're they're into the making whatever this this super meth is, you know. Yeah, that keeps that keeps you know Riddler up for days at a time working on things, but also drove him insane. Which I kind of can go back and almost forgive the Gillum March, you know. No, stuff I did from. Cha- shouldn't change his look that much. Oh, well, what's no, funny? but well, like well, well, him being all strung out and gross. You but know? What, like, what I like about it though is the idea that he was just effectively taking brain steroids to be an even better mm-hmm. Riddler. Is kind of yeah. a nice idea <laughs> yeah. in a weird way. Um, and just like Blanco's art, the way that he's just able to shift from this to you get to the next page and it becomes very noir again. Mm-hmm. Um, and just the, the way that the coloring is, everything's kind of really muted. Well, I mean, if you, you if know. you take that two page layout, which is the green question mark layout, yeah, um, the idea that that's essentially him recounting things in his head. So the idea that Riddler's head mm-hmm. is literally a question mark makes a lot of sense. Right. But then yeah. we come back to reality and it's you know back to normal. And uh, it, yeah, but it just makes it pop that much more. You know, yeah. just, it's it makes just, a lot of sense. It's I I really enjoy it. Yeah, and uh, Catwoman talks to like her, her one of her main dudes, Leo, about how you know he's like you know maybe you should you know call him Batman. Like maybe, yeah. maybe this is the time to do this to like help save Ivy. And she's like, no, no, we agreed not to like you know uh, get for him a year. Th- for a year. We'll stay apart and like, do our own thing. Uh, so she's insisting that this is her mess. She's going to help clean it up because she, you know, took on Alley Town. Uh, we cut though to Penguin and Father Valley. This is the first time we've had a Father Valley scene that's not been him kind of like spying on Catwoman or whatever in quite some time. And Penguin's like, "Hey, like Riddler's kind of my associate. <laughs> like, you know, I didn't really pay you to, uh, to 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 you know kill him." And it's this confrontation where you know Father Valley. Which, by the way, I love that he was very, like, stern-faced until Penguin corrects himself and calls him Father Valley. Because at first he just calls him Mr. Valley. Right. Uh, uh, so I like that little moment. But it's this idea that Father Valley believes he's on a mission from God. <laughs> and it's not... He, he's yeah. not just a hired gun. He's not just a tool that Penguin's got in his repertoire to, like, you know, go after someone. Uh, he He's someone who... He, he, he talks about the storm and the... the, 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 the you know, if you're at sea and... You, like well the reason why i like this is because at the end of the the end of the scene rather where mm-hmm. he eventually takes out a bunch of penguins you know henchmen and uh, a glorious two-page layout where he's got like, the blade at the end of his boot and he's just killing people left and right and he kind of right. compares himself himself to the storm you know the, the seaman you know ask god for the for the for the way to get through the storm but mm-hmm. he doesn't believe he controls the you know the the sea or the storm. You know the the, the storm is kind of this uh, right. so force. His of contract isn't with Father Valley; it's yes. with God, and that he's just an instrument of God. Yes. So you don't have to take your your issues up with me. I'm going to handle them, whether you like it or not. You don't have any yeah. say. And I that really gave this character a point of view that really upped him. You know. What yeah, because I mean? his right. final line is he's walking through the rain is you know beware of the storm and he's got a smell on his face. Yeah. So he sees himself as the storm. Uh, he has a knife in his boot, all right. And he carries around that... kunai by the look of it for yeah. reasons. Yeah. And, well, he's, and, he's got a whole because he uh, he opens up his coat, and all I could think was, yeah. uh, "What are you buying, stranger?" <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I you. I got Joe. He opened up his coat, and I thought of uh, admittedly part of this because we were talking about line well recently, but uh, hot fuzz. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> he just opened up the the the, the, the coat, yeah. and they've just got guns. <laughs> but yeah, no, like this is a dude that, that keeps a knife, a knife in his boot, like a knife blade, <laughs> and on it, and then he takes one of those those kunai knives and throws it through a dude's hat, 
and murders him. Yeah. Like, Actually, just on comparisons to open it up, you know, I just because just I watched The Matrix recently, when they go through the metal detectors and they say, hey, yeah. what, you know, what have you got? And he opens up his coat and he's just like decked out in machine guns. There's a lot mm-hmm. of good opening up coats to weapons, isn't there? Hey, yeah. there's, there's something about being a human being that makes opening up a trench coat to reveal something fascinating. Just look, ask any pervert. Uh, they love it. <laughs> Um, that was a quality okay. joke. That was a quality joke. You know it. You on, brought on that down note. the tone about three notches. <laughs> yeah. So Celia so, yeah, gears up, gets her cat woman outfit uh, on to go and. I I have a question oh. about her shawl piece that goes over her shoulders. How does that zip up? Does 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 she start it at her neck and bring it down? Because because most yeah. things go from yes. the top to, to so. I mean, that's only zipping? just by convention. There's no reason for that. But Ooh. the zip function la- functionality of it would work still. Yeah, gravity does not uh, factor. She's, she has right, chosen I'm to just... have this designed to zip that way I... so she can have it at, you know, at her chest rather than up by her neck. Right. I was just thinking, like, I thought I lost way too much time thinking about this, reading the book, going like, mm-hmm. why? I, I should not care about the suit design, but how does that piece work? Like, functionality-wise... The, the only problem with it is it means that she can't, like, zip down to let her neck free. Right. Yes. And that that's the whole thing. So I was just thinking, I was like, is it upside down? This is what happens when you rush a Catwoman suit? You know? I think like, the fact that whenever you see it in the future, the the, mm-hmm. the zipper bit, that you, you know, the you actually hold the yeah. zip, is always at the bottom. Yeah, it's always right. dangling. It implies that, yes, it does zip upwards to undo right. it. Right. Um, yeah, it's just weird. That's all. It's all weird. You know? I don't think it's oh, a yeah. rush design, though. I think the design was thought. Oh, no, no, no. When just, I mean rush yeah. design, I mean in story. Oh, like, sure. Like she was having the suit made, and she was like, "I, I don't care. I just put a zipper on. You know, I need to protect my neck." <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think it makes about it go, Matt. Uh, so, Catwoman goes to does uh, stake out. I was going to say stake out, but she she mm-hmm. basically they're renting out the plant where they seemingly had ivy and a bunch of all this other mm-hmm. like, equipment. Uh, and she like sneaks into the trucks that are you know escaping yeah. with all the evidence basically. It doesn't really find anything useful. There maybe it's something on a hard drive, but otherwise still a bunch of shredded paper mm-hmm. and various bits of machines and and whatnot. Uh, so it's kind of kind of a dud. But it does lead to a really cool action sequence when some of the the the, the car that's like sort of escorting these two trucks like catches her. So we get a fun sequence where I kind of love she uses her whip to like grab onto the neck of a guy coming through the sunroof of the car and uses that as like a almost a grapple pulls, point. Yeah. Pulls him out yeah. and slingshots herself in through the rear window. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's a really fun little action sequence and the rain's all going the whole time. And because they just had that comparison where Father Valet compared himself to the storm, mm-hmm. having the rest of all these action sequences take place in the rain just adds a bit of atmosphere that has a bit more, I don't know, thematic yeah. meaning um, than it does not, usually. It's great. I- She's in it now. Yeah. Like, she's in the storm. She she's is. not bewearing the storm. And, <laughs> uh, just uh, Bel Air's colors again. You know, mm-hmm. here the, the, the red light on the, the, the brakes of the truck. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, they just, you know, they give it all this glow and it looks great. Yeah. And when they get to the destination and they're like, and she's looking, it's like, you know, where's Ivy? What's going on? And there's just this mysterious stranger with a, with a hat who's like, you're looking for poison ivy. And it is very pulpy in noir where. She's like, who are yeah. you? And he's like, not important. <laughs> and he's got like tattoos on his hands, or yeah. are they? Like, I don't know if they're part of the gloves. Are they gloves? Like, yeah, they're, they're gloves. it's a weird design. Still, like, it's it's a specific. Design. It, it made me think of of Slam Bradley, and I know it's not him, hmm. but it made me think this guy's down in the factory district, wearing a fedora, you know, kind of like a a detective. But yeah, we've got this mysterious know. new character who who may be mm-hmm. out to help. May, maybe he's more shades of grey. We don't really right. know for sure. But he tells her of uh, Sidhart Roy, who's this rich guy who was behind a lot of this stuff. Mm-hmm. And he's a collector of art, but he kind of went beyond art. So he seemingly has bought Ivy and her tank as a piece of art to show yeah. off to his rich, corrupt friends. Uh, yeah. So the end of the issue is her. Go- she gets, you know, she forges some invites to this party at this guy's house. Mm-hmm. And the end of the issue is her walking in with her dress. Do you know what I'm liking here? I'm realizing that they're gradually growing her hair out because her hair's just getting yeah. a little bit longer, and it's, it's, it's still time. quite, it's still quite short right now. Mm-hmm. But I totally get that in a year's time, maybe the plan is to have it be shoulder length. Yeah, it seems to be yeah. going out. So it, um, it does what hair does. 
They're, they're putting thought into <laughs> this. Because usually they'll just Which do a time good. jump and that'll be it. And yeah, you don't see now. hair grow out as it goes. Yeah. You know? um, also, I mean, just... Even in, in real life, you tend to not notice people's hair over yeah. time. If it's yeah. someone you're seeing regularly, you tend to not yeah. really notice it because it changes a little bit. I think it's the same in this book that mm-hmm. if you flick to the first issue and then you know this issue, you'd probably see a drastic difference. Yeah. But issue to issue, you don't really notice it. Yeah. Well, I did notice that a couple of times this issue, though. Yeah, it's definitely got longer. It's one of those things that once you notice, you'll you'll look for it, but you you might not you know you might not even ever notice until it's considered. That's anything from from the Joel Jones, which it was real short, right when that started. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It was like a pixie cut, right? During the wedding era, yeah, it was really short. Uh, And then Um, here we are. Also, this this new character shows you how much hockey has ruined me. I didn't read his name as Roy. I Joel. I did the same, Matt. It's okay. Uh, I, I read it as Wa, which is the French, you know, the Quebec I don't know what, No, he's he's not French. It's fine. It's no, Roy. No. Yeah, it's Roy. But it, so I I read it as that now, just thanks to, thanks hockey. Because Canadians yeah, Canadians play hockey. Yes. Yes. Yep. yep. Uh, no, I I did the exact same, and then I went, no, that's not right. And I was like, no. I really hope Matt made the same mistake. <laughs> I did. Yeah. Well, yep. funnily enough, I did not, but that's not surprising, no. I think, to anyone. No. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, no, really, really solid issue. I, I think the Fowler Valley scene sticks out the most to me, this issue, mm-hmm. in terms of building him up as this presence and you know how much of a force he is. But we have this intriguing new character, the action scene in the car and the trucks was really cool with Catwoman, uh, and it gives us something to investigate here at the end. And yeah. obviously Ivy's a, a personal you know, goal for her. It's not just something yeah. she's doing out of the goodness of her heart. It's something I- she... Someone she cares about, so... Yeah, I do like, from looking at the solicits, each of the Jenny Frisians cover covers hints a little bit more ivy when you look at them. <laughs> that you know, new this, one this one spectacular. This, this variant and then you look at the the July variant and it's her and Selena basically, you know, back to back. Mm. Also so, DC, please go back to putting the variants in the covers on the digital yes, please. so we can see them. Yes. That'd be that'd be convenient for sure. For sure. Yeah. Uh Matt, what are you giving Catwoman? I I'm gonna give this one a nine. I really like this one. Mm, uh, car? I, I'm going to be an 8.5, but I mean, yeah. still very, very good. Yeah, I I agree with the 8.5. I think I'd, I'm almost tempted to give it a 9, uh, but I'm just not. <laughs> like, like, I think it's got some really great standout sequences that I really, really loved, but maybe it's not completely the full package uh, that other issues in the past have been, I guess. Is, mm-hmm. so Matt it's, needs to make up for all the nines he didn't give in the first few issues while he wasn't reading it. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. There you go. There you go. And no, it is, a, it is a stupidly good book. Like, I didn't want to read another Catwoman book, but as as I've grown more fond of, of Ram V, or Ram 5, as I used to call him. Uh, He's undeniable. Yes, you can't. Like, it, it is, and I can't wait to get this in trade, because this is one that I'm going to want up on the shelf. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I hope this gets a nice... Oversized uh, omnibus or deluxe yeah, edition collection. Blanco's art—that's that, the whole other thing, too. It also uh, reminds me of a, a Brubaker Phillips book, in part because very similar tone, especially yeah. in the art. And I think it's kind of amazing because you know, we've seen Blanco on quite a few books over the last mm-hmm. few years, um, and obviously he worked on Catwoman with uh, mm-hmm. with Jones for most of her run. Uh, but I don't know; it, it didn't. It, it never had quite the same. Tone to it as it does now, right? Yeah, no, and I saw this year. Another really good. Uh, it's it's funny you start with Justice League and Flash. Those two books are kind of the ones that are a bit more mixed in various ways. Um, but then we get to Nightwing and Catwoman, and it's like here, here's, here's you know, there's a reason why we're very positive right now in DC because yeah. there's some really good stuff coming out every when, week. When, when half our books of a week are this level, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm. Yeah. I'm very happy with that. Let's see. So well, Blanco did uh, uh, Batwoman too back in yes. the beginning, which was Rebirth. unfortunate because it was after uh, Epting, right? Yeah, yeah. So yes. it was like we we were like, no, this is good, but it have just come off of Epting, and it felt like it, it felt at the time like it was so different. Down. Yeah, it was so different, yeah. and it was we fell in love with the Epting art that it was just hard to get into. Uh, anyway, let's move on. So. Uh, we do have some Patreon books uh, every month at patreon.com slash Uh The higher tier patrons can make myself or Connor read a book. Uh, so we've each got one to do today. 
Uh, I'll jump in first with American Vampire issue 18. And this is the end of this arc. I, I feel like this may be a quicker one to talk about. Uh, Matt, hold your applause. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, Pearl showed up at the end of the last issue, mm-hmm. just as Skinner was about to kill Henry. And we get the fight. Uh, you know, Henry get, tries to jump in, but he gets like hit to the side very quickly. Uh, the art's <laughs> glorious. A, human. Yeah, a lot of speed lines, uh, a lot of the long fingernails with the vampires, lots of blood flying. You know, it's pretty much what you expect. and But you've kind of earned it because you've been building up to this confrontation. And, you know, Skinner's just trying to twist the knife. Hey, he lied to you about this mission that he was going on. So what else is he lying about? Has he been lying about loving you all these years? And you get to this point where Skinner kisses her. Um, because he, he's saying all this like, stuff. He's like, oh, you're just a bad girl at heart. You just need someone like me to like, sort of unleash it. And he kisses her. And the way she backs away in fear after the, the kiss panel is enough to tell you that she's scared that she kind of liked it, or she's scared that she kind of, like, there is a little bit of truth to what he's saying, that there is, and, you know, maybe it is just because, you know, she is part vampire, or she is all vampire, but you know Mm -hmm. what I mean, you know, that's the vampire part of her, it's the monstrous part of her that he's appealing to, and she feels awful about that. Uh, So it's it's this kind of bittersweet thing that when she kills him here, and I know Skinner, you know, technically doesn't stay dead, but, you know, she pulls out a gold blade and stabs him, and it's a great, great big moment, but this is this bittersweet thing because it's not just killing this monster that's been in her life and it's been this like culprit. She's also kind of killing something that's hiding like something that she's ashamed of a little bit here. So that's really cool. And and she goes and gets Henry. Uh, the there's that one guy who was on his squad that survives who was left for dead last issue. They the hear and they pull him up. Uh, they run to the water. There's a big explosion. The uh, the liquor style vampires are in the water, uh, but they can't come up to the top quite yet because it's still sunlight. Uh, but sun's going down. It's just so lucky that the helicopters come in and you know descend the ladder. And I I do love as they're as they're being pulled out with the the drop down ladder. You can see the hands of the vampires in the water just coming for them because it's getting darker and darker. Uh, it's just beautiful art stuff, which is not a surprise. I mean, Albuquerque's been you know uh, mm-hmm. wonderful throughout this. Uh, and, you know, Henry and Pearl have this thing where he's finishing his letter and she comes in to see him in the hospital and the sort of jokes about, you know, him having another vampire lady and then he jokes about her having someone, another musician, and she looks really sad. She says, no, no other musicians. And it's kind of, again, bittersweet. But ultimately, she ends this with sort of saying, look, the only thing that's really important is the, the, the part that's true. Is, is it true when you say you love me? And he says, yeah, I love you. And she said, well, that's all I needed to know. And she rips up the letter and he kind of jokes, hey, that, that put a lot of time into that. There was good bits and everything. It was really emotional. And it is, is kind of funny in a meta way because that's kind of that's the narration we've been reading for him. The whole the whole arc is mm-hmm. his letter that he's been writing her. So her ripping it up at the end is a little funny in, in that sense. So you know, it ends with them kissing in the hospital and it's a really sweet moment. Uh, and there's just the one final page where the other survivor... Uh, the, the two nurses are kind of joking about uh, finding various bits of shrapnel in him, and it seems that part of the shrapnel was his necklace, which I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was either either, either you know either something that was uh, dispelled vampires or like a vial of holy water or a cross or mm-hmm. something. But the idea being that that was holding off the transformation and just the, the final panels, his eyes changing as they are kind of joking about finding a wedding ring or something uh, in his body. Uh, so, really solid stuff, and it's a really quick, you know, summary because ultimately it's a lot of action. It's the confrontation between Pearl and Skinner, and that is half of the issue with the big dramatic kiss that happens. And the reason why it works so well is because it's her reaction. It's her disgust that not that he did this, that he kissed her, that maybe there's some truth that there is a part of her that is kind of attracted to her or is tempted by this monstrous side of herself. So. And it's, it's really just a kind of a summary of, like, you know, she always is fighting this monstrous side to have this normal life with Henry. And this is kind of this this real fruition of that side of her coming to the forefront. It's kind of simple in a lot of ways, but it really plays off her struggle constantly of being in this relationship. So, and then their kind of, like, moment in the hospital afterwards is this kind of, yeah, that's always something she has to fight. And their romance kind of, like, endures through that. So it's a very uplifting ending. Just when you mm-hmm. thought the arc was going to give you a really dark ending where everything was going to be sad. 
Uh, the cool thing about this is that next issue is not issue 19. Uh, this is where I break away, unless Tyler tells me differently, but I think this is where I break away and go to survival of the fittest issue one next month. So look forward to that. Yeah, uh, yeah buddy. So, yeah, Arts Glorious is a fun payoff to everything. It's not just a payoff to this arc, it feels like, a, again, a payoff to, like, uh, Pearl and Henry's story thus far, uh, which is really cool. So, uh, I will happily give this a solid 9 out of 10. Uh, so, there you go, that's American Vampire, issue 18. Uh, so, Carter's got a Patreon book, he's going to talk about Nocterra, issue 2. Also, Scott Snyder, funnily enough. Uh, right? Also about creatures that can't deal with the light. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Scott Snyder and Tony Daniel uh, on art. So, unsurprisingly, looks very nice still. Uh, this is issue two. Uh, so obviously, first issue I think was a bit oversized and kind of set up everything, so it was pretty dense. This one's a lot more simplistic, um, in a good way. Uh, not in a bad way, just more doesn't want to bog itself down too much. It, you know, issue two it wants to wants to get rolling and, and get telling on the the fun stuff. Uh, but we do open with a bit of a flashback uh, to kind of when everything kicked off. Uh, it's just uh, Val and her brother, kind of their parents lying and being like, hey, everything's going to be fine. And I'm sure this is nothing sort of thing. Uh, and they're outside in like, a big prayer group with the whole street kind of praying together. Um, but the kids are inside. And, you know, they're just going through everything in the house, all the, all the TV remotes and such, trying to find batteries, so using various torches. So like, yeah, these these will be useful. They you know, they might be half dead, but it's better than nothing. Uh, um, but you know, back to the you know the, the main story because that's, that's all we get there. Just this this bit of showing how Val has you know always been looking out for her brother, which is kind of what she's doing now. She's trying to find this uh, mythical machine to cure him of the infection. Uh, and we're in her truck. She's doing the uh, she's she's running this this guy and his uh, daughter or granddaughter um, to the you know this mythical sanctuary where this machine is. Uh, and and that's kind of most of the issue. They stop at a what a, where there's essentially a rest stop, but it's uh, they call them ports. Uh, it's called the Neon Grove. Um, various drivers have set them up all over the place. It's, all this place just filled with you know various lights. This one, as the name implies, it's all neon lights. Just so, you know, this is a little bit of a safe haven where you can stop and breathe, you know, and get out of your truck and stretch your legs quite safely. Uh, and, you know, there's just a lot of bits of her talking with this old guy who. She d- she deduces like, hey, you kind of do actually know what you're doing out here in the wilderness. You've lived out here. You haven't just been holed up in this sanctuary your whole life like you claimed. Uh, I know that because of the way you're holding that certain flower. Like you know exactly where to hold it because if you hold it from the other end, your hand will swell up and you- you're you're doing it correctly. And there's no way you do that just by chance. Uh, and just bits like that, that that's extending this mythology of like, okay, you know, this is what the world is, and you know her reading these people. Um, but she gets a, a radio from some other truck drivers going, hey, there's this guy coming after you that, that we introduced at the end of the, the previous issue, all in the ultra black kind of outfit. Uh, black Stop Bill is his name. And uh, basically, he's he's on the hunt for her. Um, he's attacked this this convoy. He's killed some of them. Like five of their trucks are you know on, on fire. So they're kind of screwed. And she just want to like get off the road. You know, don't let him find you. But it's a little bit too late. Uh, he shows up anyway in, in huge, like, monster trucks, essentially. Uh, and, like, monster trucks and, like, sports cars. This this weird combination where every, everyone else is in, like, big truck. Like, you know, haul trucks. You know, like, like what you expect. Of if you think of a trucker and like what they're doing in you know, that. But these guys are in, like, really sleek bikes, sports cars monster trucks it's such a different visual and it's like no they're 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 being cool because they can uh but you know he's here to to get the you know to to kill the guy uh and and again it's still not clear exactly why but there's you know they're 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 gonna run away and she she has like a traps rigged in a van like we like we saw last issue where she did a whole bunch of stuff uh while she was bringing in the refugees it's the same again here. She sets up like a, an explosion just to cover them while they get out, and uh, and, and they start running. That's that's the end of the issue. There's um just a bit more on the, the mythology that we learn as we go through. Uh, the guy, while he is presumably lying that okay, he, he's he's never been to the sanctuary. This sunburn's not real, but there is some stuff where he tells the truth. Where 
uh, you know, this machine, or, or at least seemingly tells the truth, and she believes in this machine is real. He did create it, and it found the wrong thing. The, the point of it was to find heaven, but instead, it's found hell, and that's what that's where they are now. That's what it's called. Uh, uh, and again, this ties in with a lot of her narration over the issue, talking about you know going back to the start where it's oh well, maybe this is you know the path to heaven or. Uh, maybe this is purgatory that we're in now. Uh, there's all this stuff, but you know, this this damnation where he's like, no, we're in hell. We're gonna be here forever. She goes, no, oh, that's the truest thing she's ever heard. And that's when she believes it. It's, it. She's a very cynical character, uh, but still kind of doing the right thing here and, and trying. Uh, it's a real solid issue. Uh, a lot of fun action, great art. Just, uh, give it a name. I was just laughing because. Uh... You were going a little bit quiet towards the end, and I think it was picking up like something in the background from Matt's mate. <laughs> the garbage man's here. Yeah, so. it was like the mate was escape was going. This is more important. Whatever Connor's saying, the garbage is here. Uh, That's fair. But that'll wrap up uh, the books, which things like the final part of the show, and I'll, I'll do this a little bit speedily because I know Matt needs to get away. Uh, so uh, favorite stuff of the week we do here at the end. Uh, favorite panel slash moment. Favorite cover. Favorite art. And favorite uh, top five books, which is ranking the books. I said that weird. Matt, what's your <laughs> Panel slash moment of the week. Um, so it's gonna be from uh, Nightwing, and there's a ton to choose from. Uh, but I think I'm gonna go through the. Uh, oh man, which one do I want to do? I think I'll, I'll give the the scene where uh, Dick has bought the pizza out for everybody. That's um, cool. Just a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling panel. Yeah, I think I'll go with a fun one with the the phone going off as. Uh, <laughs> You know, he's been made fun of for being picked all the dings. All the dings, yeah. And uh, just generally that little sequence of, like, you know, Bab saying she's already put it in the group chat and all the dialogue yeah. that goes with that. It's just too delightful to not love. Uh, Car? Uh, both good choices. Just to be different, I'll pick something from Catwoman. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to go with the bit where she is slingshotting herself into the back of the car. Just, just look cool right. as shit. Very good. Pretty I mean, cool. that, that could have won for me in a, a week without uh, yeah. Nightwing. So. Yeah. I really thought you were going to go with the, the Daredevil one, Connor. I left it for you. Mm. Uh, honestly, you know, yeah. it, it could have been. I just I thought, oh, I'll represent a different yeah. book. Two, two, two. Mm-hmm. The Nightwing's all pretty good. Oh, very neat. Uh, all right. Uh, cover of the week. Uh, I'll jump in here first and just pick the main Nightwing cover. I do like the art of the main Justice League cover, but I think conceptually mm-hmm. the Nightwing one's just a bit more stark and sticks out a bit yeah. more. Uh, Connor? That is very nice. That's probably my second choice, but I'm gonna go with the Catwoman variant because I'm I felt a self parody at this point. And and I yeah, uh, I feel like you know, that that's both of us, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. All so, right. So yeah, the, it's Catwoman variant. The frozen cover for both of you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, favorite art of the week, um, Matt. <laughs> Boy, this is tough. It's either Redondo or or Blanco. Um. And, and going first, I'll set it, and I'll, I'll just say it's Redondo for Nightwing. Yeah, I... Because Marquez is very good, but it has to... Yeah, mm-hmm. it's Redondo. <laughs> it's, yeah, it, yeah. Is, like, it is almost unfair between... Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the Redondo and Lucas team versus, you know, Blanco and Belair on, on Catwoman. Like, they're neck and neck. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I... But I am going to give it to Nightwing. Just, just the edge. I mean, I, yeah, I can see. I think Marquez still has a chance. I, I think, I think Flash for me though is the only one that's like not even in the running. Sorry, Flash, yeah. but it's just not. Uh, well, even I, I, Marquez honestly, and even Zermanico in in mm. the backup. Um, it says a lot that I like that art a lot from both those artists in Justice League. Yeah. It's not even in the running for me this week. Yeah, you know, in in a lesser week that has a chance, but mm-hmm. yeah. not this week. Everyone picked an artist, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right, so top five books, Matt, go. Or top four, I suppose, in this case. <laughs> number one, Nightwing. Uh, number two is uh, Catwoman. Number three is, is Justice League. Connor? Yeah, same order. With Flash at number four? Uh, uh, I, I guess, begrudgingly. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, uh, is this the first time we've had the exact same order? Because I'm going Nightwing, I'm going then Catwoman, I'm going then Justice League, and then I'm going Flash. So, uh, we all had the exact same order. Maybe that's just because there's less books, so it's more likely to happen, but mm-hmm. still. Uh, interesting, all the same. So, what is coming next week? That is all that's really left to tell you, all of my usual plugs. 
Uh, coming next week from DC Comics, we have Detective Comics 1035, mm-hmm. Action Comics 1030, Batman Superman 17. We have the new book of Robin issue 1, Joshua Williamson's new run on Damien, so that's going to be cool and see- interesting to see. Excited. Teen Titans Academy issue 2 is coming out, as is Harley Quinn issue 2. It is worth mentioning, Connor needs to read that for Patreon, but he mm-hmm. is going to be missing next week, so it'll just be whenever he gets back. Uh, he'll do that. So. Yes, I have to work, unfortunately. Uh, so that's fair. Uh, Batman Black and White issue 5 is out, and so is Ruby Justice League issue 1 uh, of interest, but obviously... And of course, that is the black and white with the Gillan McKelvey story, so I do hope, in my absence, you do it justice. Uh, I'm probably not going to read it, but sure. <laughs> How much are you going to pay me, Connor? Some good thoughts. Yeah, okay, well, there we go. Hey, Matt made it clear that you could pay, f- pay for it. I mean, if you really want to, Matt will do it for you, but... Uh... <laughs> there you go. That's what's coming. That sounded wrong. Next week. <laughs> okay, uh, let's get going. But keep in mind, it's clock here. But, but keep in mind, next uh, thing you'll get from us is the top fifty special. Uh, I'm looking forward to recording that tomorrow. It should be a nice, fun, chill uh, experience. So, uh, look forward to that. Uh, but yes, I will take time to thank our Patreon producers for the month. So thank you to Tyler Hess, Cindy Palacios, David Sharp, Borden now, Al Treisman, Christopher Moy, David Brown, and Stanley. Not Stanley. Uh, Stanley. They are Patreon producers, meaning they are $20 or more at patreon.com slash TV. but you can support us for as little as $1 per month and help keep all the podcasts coming, as well as all the other content we do at Mailfuzz TV. So go over and have a look. Uh, the $5 tier in particular, you get early access to the show by a day. You get it on Saturday evening or night or late late Saturday if you're in the UK because it's past midnight uh, instead of the Sunday time. But uh, go and have a look and see if you're interested in supporting everything we do that way. You can also support us by simply hitting the like button, subscribing, commenting, rating the podcast on iTunes, where we get your podcast from, give us five stars and a review. All of those things do help. Or share us out. Follow us on Twitter at DC Comics Podcast. Uh, all of these things are a big help and support us, so please do. Uh, but otherwise, that is us. So thank you once again for watching and listening. We always appreciate it. Keep reading DC Comics, and remember to never get lost in the Speed Force. Jake has heart.